Well, my clock says it's 530, so we can go ahead and begin. We're going to start our special meeting at 530 on January 10th uh, with uh, regarding some uh, uh, information from our planning director, Jay Camp. So, Jay, the stage is yours, sir. Wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we did forward the presentation out to you in advance. I know some of you may have had a chance to take a look at it, but I'll... Uh, try to give you some good context to go along with it this evening. Um, and I will ask, and I think we did this last time, for you to please interrupt me, because I would love to hear if you have any questions during the presentation and it'll give me a break so I'm not talking at you for 90 straight minutes. Um, so having said that, unless anyone has any questions to start off with, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen here. Let me get this in slideshow mode. All right, so I, I gave some thought to, well, how do I wanna uh, explain planning in a, in a nutshell in 90 minutes? So I sort of broke this down into what our department does, you know, a little bit on current events, some of the things that we're working on and, and just a little teaser on the, you know, what's on the horizon, what are some trends, what are some issues that the town will inevitably be facing in the coming months and coming years. So that's sort of the, the game plan this evening and we'll get started. <clears throat> So our planning department, uh, we're a department of six, um, have been uh, for, gosh, close to 20 years now. We have uh, four professional planners on staff, all of which have their AICP credential, that's American Institute of Certified Planners. Uh, we also have code enforcement and a uh, zoning technician and also a deputy town clerk, that's Shana Robertson. Um, We've had a full-time uh, planner in-house since Kathy was hired in 1989. So the town does have a fairly long uh, tradition of planning going back to the, the late 1980s. This is a, a, a slide from the housing report that Nadine Bennett put together uh, last year. We, we thought this was a, a great document and sort of encompassed uh, uh, where we're at uh, from a housing perspective in town. And just wanted to call out some of these numbers you see here on the screen. This is really just this. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. On, on your previous slide. Yeah. Um, is Carla re retiring? He is. Okay. Uh, I had folks asking, I guess we have a, his job posted, right? It is posted. Uh, I don't remember the close date. It should be coming up soon, though. So we're we're on top of it. We want to make sure that we don't have a um, a vacancy for too long, because it is an important function in the town. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Oh no problem. No problem. So uh, population stats. Uh, we are an aging population, as you can see uh, here. Twelve to seventeen percent, sixty-five plus. Families with children are decreasing. Um, our number of house, housing units obviously is uh, increasing. Um, you see here just a quick snapshot of some of the types of projects that have been approved um, in, in the past decade from 2010 to 2020 and, and really see that that move towards more attached housing with uh, townhomes and multifamily really sort of uh, dominating the uh, construction types. I will say that housing market continues to be wild as you read in the news. So that $365,000 median selling price is uh, it's likely crested 400 by this time. Um, so that continues to move forward. Uh, just a few of our functions, uh, and I took a, f a little bit of this background did come from our Matthews 101, where we talk to the general public every uh, fall about uh, our department. Um, administration of the U Unified Development Ordinance, which I'll talk about here in a little while. Uh, obviously, rezonings and subdivisions, uh, code enforcement, as was just mentioned, some limited permitting. Um, we have an interlocal agreement with Mecklenburg County. Uh, so that the county is handling a lot of, um, well, well, most trades review, like electrical, plumbing, building permits, things of that nature. Um, on the land development side, you know, erosion control and, and really major land development review. Um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which is which a really, really growing field. Uh, the Board of Adjustment, Planning Board, um, we do site inspections. And then daily citizen developer inquiries and zoning administration, which is also something um, that was brought in house 
probably over close to two decades ago. So we, our senior planner, Rob Will, also functions as our zoning administrator. So if there's ever an interpretation or decision that needs to be made about our code, that goes to the zoning administrator, and that is Mr. Will. So sort of current planning on the long range planning side, uh, obviously the land use plan, that's our, our most important document in our department, but also the creation of small area plans, downtown planning, corridor studies, uh, policy development is often an overlooked one. And then just the general looking ahead at trends, um, transportation patterns, and, and sort of anticipating the needs of the community. We were heavier into, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Before Dana Stujanke joined us, transportation planning was handled by multiple individuals and departments. Um, we, we play uh, an assistance role um, and still attend numerous meetings related to NCDOT projects and, and the Silver Line as well. Um, and here I have an example of our East John uh, 485 small area plan. Um, and, and as you can see here, just looking at really, well, what does an area plan do? gives general guidance um, from a policy perspective on how an area might develop out in the future. So for citizens, it gives them a better understanding of how their community might change. Um, for someone on the land development side, it gives them a better idea of, well, what is it the town's looking for? Are you looking for a shopping mall, employment, housing, open space? Um, so this was our uh, consensus build out scenario that talks about the different uses and where they might land um, at East John and 485. So some of the items that, that you might think uh, uh, happen in our department, um, I mentioned building permits, uh, minimum housing. Carlo does work with uh, the county on uh, minimum housing issues. So that could be anything from a, um, a building that's been declared unsafe for numerous reasons. Um, it could be code violations um, that relate more to health and safety rather than structural. So we do, we do work um, very closely with the county on those issues as they pop up from time to time. Um, floodplain administration, we have floodplain ordinances. We have post-construction ordinances all in place that, uh, and I'll talk more about post-construction later, that, that are specific to the town, but the administration actually comes from Mecklenburg County because it just doesn't um, make sense for us to duplicate um, that service when, when we've got folk, knowledgeable folks of the county that can handle it for us. Um, building inspections, again, that, that is a county function. I mentioned the interlocal agreement a few slides ago. Um, and then we do some permitting, um, sign permits. That is something that we've had issues with in the past that we took partially in-house. So we do review for new signs that come in and uh, the ultimate permits uh, issued by the county. All right, so why plan? This is another uh, Matthews 101 slide. You know, the general uh, language you'll see in most development ordinances, this is for the health, safety, and well-being of residents. And, and there are numerous reasons. It's growth management is the one you probably think of, but it can be related to economic development, uh, the, the goal of creating more open space, um, historic preservation. Uh, planning is a really wide and varied field. So it's uh, we tend to think of it in the context of what Matthews is like, but you know, drive two hours east of Matthews to a to a, a quiet corner of, of the state and the, the issues are, are totally different from a planning perspective. It's uh, how to bring more jobs to the community and, um, and things of that nature. So every community is different and the needs are different. Um, and, and this is just an image I always like to pop up during Matthews 101. This is uh, the Oglethorpe plan for Savannah, Georgia. Most of you have probably visited Savannah at one time or another. And what amazes me is, you know, nearly 300 years later, that imprint is still there. The, the idea for the public squares, uh, they, they didn't maybe look as beautiful as they do today. They had a, they had a different purpose back then, but that, that imprint still exists nearly 300 years later. So it's uh, one of our, our better examples in the United States of uh, well-laid plans. All right, so where to start? Uh, we have a lot of existing plans on the books. Uh, there may have been a few that I left out here, but this was just a general summary of uh, some of the, the various documents and the years that those were adopted by um, your board. 
um, our land use plan, which is uh, now a decade old, our, same for our, our downtown master plan. Um, we've had numerous uh, downtown related studies that, that it can get a little bit confusing. We, we did a mobility study, we did a streetscape design plan, we did a streetscape improvement plan. The reason that a lot of these documents exist is that we've, we've been able to get grant funding. So if there's a transportation bent to the, the item, uh, we've, we've got CRTPO funds that have covered, you know, he's I think like 80% is a typical coverage. Like it's usually like a 20% match. So the, you know, the mobility study was, as I recall, over $100,000, uh, but we, we contributed a much smaller portion of that. So the, the mobility study, the streetscape, I think, I think we, discussed, we covered the cost of the design plan because that was more aesthetic, like what the sidewalks are going to look like, what kind of trees we're going to plant. But the streetscape improvement plan, which dealt with actual improvements in the right of way, that was another uh, project that we received uh, some reimbursement funds from CRTPO. Uh, some lesser known and older uh, reports, the Crestel Rising report, uh, that was done by a, a American Planning Association team that came down about a decade ago. Um, that, that was a really great process. We still have that on our website. And then um, one that we don't hear Jay, much. Jay, yes, yes, sir. What is that? What is that? Christelle Rising Report. Yeah, so um, there was an opportunity advertised, as I recall, back in 2010 by the American Planning Association in the town, and it was Kathy at the time, applied for us to uh, it, think of it as a grant opportunity, but had a, a very talented team of planners from around the country came and did a sort of mini plan for Crestdale. They met with residents, uh, kind of took stock of what's going on in the community, what some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses were, what some of the opportunities were, um, and then put this report together. Um, so it was a really great process. We were really lucky, uh, really fortunate, rather, to, to have um, such a such a great team of individuals. And I'll I'll talk a little bit about that about the Heritage Trail on a, in a, a slide here in just a few minutes. But yeah, well, I think the Heritage uh, Trail was, a, was an outgrowth of that Crestdale Rising report, as an example. It absolutely was. It absolutely was, okay. Hazel. That's, that's okay. probably one of the, the visits. But I, I think there may have also been some discussion. I need to go back and read the report. You know, branding and signage, I need to go back. I think that might have been a discussion. Of course, we've got the branding in the community and, and, and the wayfinding signage. So, right. okay. um, yeah, so overall, a great, great endeavor by the town. <laughs> And then uh, I always forget how to pronounce his name, but this gentleman, his name is Joe Minicosi. Uh, he kind of, kind of became a this low key superstar in the in the planning and tax base world. I don't know how many people live in that world. Maybe he's the only one, but he started working with communities around the southeast of the country, uh, looking at the impacts to communities' tax bases uh, from different types of development. And his favorite example was always that so many communities think that if, if they could just get a Walmart to town, that it would be great. You know, they're going to bring jobs. It's a big development. We're going to get this big tax bill. And as he would explain it, it really came down to those were actually poor returns on investment for a lot of communities that when you have a, a large single story building and a big parking lot that communities just didn't see the return on investment as they would from other types of development. So we still have a copy of that. I'm happy to, I don't think it's still on our website, but I'm happy to share that if anybody would like to reread. It, it is a great read. Um, yeah, so this, I, I thought, I didn't realize it was the next slide. So this was, I uh, actually used this slide for our orientation um, two years ago in February of 2020. So that was the Heritage Trail when it was just, just under construction. I should have run out back and, and taken an updated photo, but you can see here, uh, this is a, a slide from the Crestdale report, and this red line here uh, indicates proposed heritage trail. So it did take us uh, almost a decade, but you know we got there. We thought that was a um, a good win for the community. Uh, Jay, if I could ask you to back up one slide. Yeah. Yeah, that last uh, Minakotsi report. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, is that purely based from a tax pers uh, perspective and not an overall community impact perspective? It, it was primarily tax-based, but Hazen, I'm trying to remember, I need to dig the report up. I think that when he looked at some development types, he did factor in like 
crime and, and impact on like police as well. Like some communities say, well, we got this big shopping center that came in, our tax base went up, but we also had to hire, you know, an extra police officer because we've had more. So I, I think he did look at it a little bit outside of that box. I was thinking more about the employment increase uh, example that you used. It appeared that he was looking at it more on a tax base versus an overall perspective. He generally was. He, ge he generally yeah. was. Okay. And, and my recollection, was... my recollection was, yeah, it was. It is, as Jay said, heavily uh, tax based and looking at how much tax revenue you get down to like per square foot. And I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but I believe the uh, most lucrative uh, building in town from a tax perspective was the Weaver Bennett and Bet Land Building. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on a very small uh, piece of land, but generated quite a bit of tax revenue for the town as compared to Target or something like that that, that didn't ge generate nearly as much per per square foot. Yeah, not not a uh, square foot of pavement for parking on their property, which which I think really led to that. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I will. So as an aside, Mark, um, townhomes, as we've looked at this over the years, pencil out fairly well. If you're looking at residential uh, development from a, from a tax base perspective, that, that is one development type that fared well in that report when we looked around, around the community. Again, another slide from Matthews 101 and... Uh, this area, I, I dug this up in our files. This is Matthew circa early 80s. So this is Matthew's Mint Hill Road. Um, this is the, the Hare Cedar headquarters here. This is US 74. And I think a developer had, this is Windsor Square. So that was probably the original developer of Windsor Square. But you know the, the, the transformation, transformation in 40-ish in years is, is rather stunning how different the community is. But I'll also point to, you know, th this is interesting to look at. But look at all this development on Matthews Mint Hill on the edge of downtown. You know, your development decisions have half century or more consequences. That, that redevelopment happens sometimes, but once you know, the, the effort to develop a site goes in, in, in a building is, is constructed, uh, these are decisions that have long lasting uh, consequences. So, uh, you know, today all of, all of these green fields are now, here's Novant and, and, and everyone knows where Chick-fil-A is at. This is Matthew's 101. Um, so yeah, long-term consequences. Uh, our north end, which I, you know, I think a lot of folks are really uh, proud of, of how this portion of downtown has uh, expanded over the past decade or so. This this is a street view just from 2009. So now, well, it was 10, 12 years ago. Now it's 13 years ago. But you know, a really, really, uh, from a plane perspective, this is a really rapid trans transformation. Um, our downtown code requires buildings to be built close to the sidewalk with parking behind. So that's why this looks more like a, a continuation of the original North Trade streetscape and not a collection of strip malls that are pushed way back from the road with parking in the front setback. Um, And, you know, I know Hazen did a really good job of kind of going through um, structure of government last week. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, what we can and can't do at a local level. Um, we're nearing 100 years since uh, zoning enabling was passed in the state. As we talked about, we're not a um, home rule state. We're kind of somewhere in between, really. But uh, if we don't have power delegated to us, we generally can't do it. Um, some of the examples of, of things that, um, that come up, uh, impact fees, you may hear about those in other states. They are popular in places like Florida. Um, they can relate to uh, schools, roads, and, and other items. And, and in these states, um, they've been very helpful towards building out um, infrastructure network, but they are essentially not allowed um, in North Carolina. Just over the border in South Carolina, uh, York County, Lancaster County are all looking at very, very hefty fees on new construction to help uh, cover the cost burden of new schools. That is not allowed in North Carolina. Um, other items that have been hot topics in planning over the last decade or so, uh, protections for billboards. Um, they've been prohibited in Matthews since the late 80s, uh, but the billboard industry um, 
they've got some great lobbyists and, and they've had a lot of changes to statutes made over the past decade or so. One of which is that, yes, you can cut trees down along the highway to ensure visibility of the billboards. So I know, Hazen, you get these emails that come across your desk sometimes and there's, there's a permit, but uh, a lot of protection for billboards. Uh, home design, there was something called the zoning aesthetics bill that passed in the last decade as well that prohibited communities from having um, architectural standards in their codes. And then finally, moratoria. Um, moratoriums are less frequent or they're, they're harder to justify than they were in years past. Uh, statute specifically says that, well, we want to update our comp plan, so we're just going to have a building moratorium for a year. You can't do that. Statute explicitly says you can't do that. Um, that's why you probably saw in the paper re over a few days ago that Cornelius just passed a, uh, a resolution that they weren't going to um, approve any more multifamily in the next six months or something, but it's a resolution. It's just a, a shot across the bow, if you will, saying that they have no intention of doing so, but it's not an official moratorium. And then finally, uh, zoning statutes for North Carolina are all contained within Chapter 160D, which uh, for those of you that were following along last fall or were on the board, um, that was our, the, uh, we, we did a, a numerous updates to our, our development ordinance to, for compliance. All right, so what is zoning anyway? Um, every parcel in the town has zoning over it. Uh, it can be, there are different zoning districts that can be residential, commercial, industrial, et cetera. Um, they do various things. Uh, uh, some examples here, dictating minimum lot area, dictating what sorts of use can occur or not occur on a site. Um, and, and the area, the, the general intent is that there's, there's an understanding of what can be built where within the community. So, you know, mayor, can someone go in and build a McDonald's with a drive-through in your neighborhood? Well, you know, without zoning in place, I don't know if it would make sense, but with zoning in place that that's not an allowed use in, in a single family uh, subdivision. Um, we have uh, quite a few zoning districts actually, and they are really sort of broken out into our traditional districts. So these are our traditional non-residential districts. You'll hear BH, you'll hear office, residential institutional, industrial one, industrial two, um, which, which heavy industrial, um, I think we have four parcels in the town, the Rock Quarry being one of them and Public Works. So I2 is a pretty rare um, district. And then we have our, what we call our conditional only districts. So these are districts where uh, a, a property owner or developer has to petition for their property to be zoned one of these. And that we've got our shopping center district, entertainment district, mixed use, um, the RVS, which you've heard a lot about, that's one that's used really regularly. Uh, Crestdale uh, has its own zoning category, uh, has for many, many years now, and so on and so forth. Jay? Yes. Uh, back, back one more, back again, please. Uh, this opened up a question which I had to ask anyway. Uh, the B3 and BH zonings, is there a restriction currently on height? building heights? Yes, each zoning district has a building height uh, maximum. I was about to say minimum. No, they don't have a minimum, but the, each, each district has a maximum. Do you um, know what the B3 and BH is off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, uh, B3, I think we call that our high-rise district. Uh, so yeah. it's a little higher. It might... It, it might be 50 feet. I would have to double check. Some of those districts uh, will allow for a taller building if you increase setbacks. So think about like, you know, the hospitals in, in the middle of the property, it's got really wide setbacks to adjacent properties in the road. Sometimes the district will allow you to increase building height if you increase your yards and setbacks, your, your separation from other properties. Uh, could I ask um, if there if you just do some research on the B3 and BH and find out what the maximum height is. And uh, that, that's uh, important information to know if we're planning on having some kind of uh, corporation coming into town, uh, if we currently have any height limitations. Yeah, I will, uh, I will send you a, a, the page. We have, we have a page that has our dimensional standards in the development ordinance. So it has all of our zoning districts and then 
setbacks, yards, and heights for each district. And, and I want to give you the right information. I think it's 40 or 50 feet. I don't want to tell you wrong, so I'll, okay. I'll just forge you a copy of it. I'm right, looking thanks. at a document, Jay, and it says 40 feet with a 50 minimum front setback of 50. Okay. For BH? For B3. For B3. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was hesitant to give you a number. Some, some of them are, are, are differ. They'll have a, uh, a footnote that will potentially allow for, for increased building height. Um, outside of the some of the mixed use in, in ENT categories, 40 feet is a really standard height limit. Like three stories is pretty typical for a height limit. I mean, there, there are some districts that allow taller development, but we're a fairly low rise community, obviously, and don't have a lot of districts that allow for really tall buildings. Jay, that is something we could change as a board, correct? You can change all of it. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, that's your... <laughs> so yeah, if Wells Fargo comes here and they want to build a eight-story building, uh, you know, we, we could allow them to do that potentially, depending on where it was, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good question, though. As well. Say that again. I just said. Thank you to Renee as well. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Sorry, I'm looking at a different document, that table now. Yeah. And it says um, 50 for B3, 40 for BH. Again, as the mayor said, these. Uh, nothing set in stone. I mean, it's not a, a static document and it, it, it always changes. We have a, a round of text amendments we're tracking right now. We tend to bring them to you all in groups. Um, so you're not you know, processing like just a sentence here or a paragraph there. We try to try to bring things to you at, in a batch. All right. So pick a district. Um, actually, well, we've, we've got it here on, on the page, uh, Mark. So we've got the B3 district and uh, you know, if if you owned a property that was B3 and said, look, I want to know what the uses are, we would go to the table here. Uh, I'm looking to open a brewery. I go across and I see, I do not see uh, a P for, and P stands for permitted. Um, so this is how we determine what uses go where within the town is the table of uses. So this is one of the most important parts of the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, it is also where when the list of permitted uses accompany a, a rezoning, this is the starting point. So if um, developers rezoning to office, we're looking, and this is just one page, obviously there's numerous pages, but the starting point is, okay, am I gonna allow everything or are we going to allow everything in that office district or is it gonna be pared back? Councils in the past have typically gone the, the paring down route and, and become kind of specific and said, look, I want a defined list of uses along with the zoning, but you don't have to do that. It could also just be, we want to allow office uses and let the market uh, do its thing. So every zoning is a little bit different, but this will always be the starting point for any conversation we have, whether it's in a rezoning or just uh, working with a, a property owner. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the CRC to in that zoning districts that well is that separate crc i don't i just snapped one page out of 30 or 40 here okay. but yes there's the the and, and that's a that's a whole other com confusing conversation there there are okay. two crc districts one used the special use permit process which really most communities are going away from because it was a quasi judicial which you know meant it was evidentiary based so if you see CRC2 on the zoning map, that is our updated version of the CRC district uh, that uses standard um, conditional zoning and straight zoning. Okay. If you all have further questions about how CRC works, I'm, I'm happy to delve into that. I can make a note. Um, all right, so this is the big document, uh, the Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, Last I checked, I think when I opened the PDF, I got 461 pages. Um, we actually just created a uh, table of contents for it. Um, you can also use control F function if you're, if you're uh, looking for something or you can phone a friend. You can just give, shoot us a, a call or an email if you don't have time to go looking for all of these items. Um, 
So why is it called a unified development ordinance? Uh, a lot of communities still have a zoning ordinance. Uh, unified just means that it packages a bunch of different regulatory requirements into one document. So our requirements for the post-construction, which is water quality, our subdivisions, uh, um, land development, uh, uh, the functions of the Board of Adjustment, the Planning Board, it is all um, under one roof, so to speak, in, in this one document and not in various places. Uh, before 2014, we had a freestanding subdivision ordinance. Um, so this does make a lot of sense. It gives you a much longer document, but it, it's, it's a little bit easier uh, to use. And this has been standard practice for uh, quite a while now. And that was adopted uh, almost eight years ago now. It was an update to the uh, 1988 zoning ordinance. That was the last major update we had had uh, before the UDO went into effect. And zoning has been in place 70 or 72, 1970 or 1972, I think when we first started really getting into zoning in Matthews. And, and a lot of our zoning originated from county zoning. Um, so you'll still see a lot of connections to Mecklenburg County. All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about overlay districts. It's something you'll hear a little bit about. That can be kind of confusing sometimes. Uh, we have multiple overlay districts in town. Um, this is an example of the, the highway overlay here uh, that was created when Township Parkway went in um, in the early 90s, I think around 91. Um, we also have a downtown overlay district. Um, I'm missing a slide here for some reason. Oh, okay, sorry, these slides are out of order. Um, hold that thought on, on overlay districts. Um, common terminology. I'm going to run through these and try to give you, I, I didn't want to create a slide for every single one. So we're done on time. All right, we're good. By right. So the zoning districts we talked about earlier, if a property is zoned R15 and someone says, I want to build a house in it, as long as that uh, development proposal meets the standards of the ordinance, they can build it. They don't need any additional approvals. They don't need any kind of legislative approval from your board. Um, staff processes it. It goes through all the building permitting and, and the development occurs. It, it could even be uh, some churches under a certain size are allowed in, um, well, I, sh I should say places of worship under a certain size are, are allowed in most residentially zoned portions of town. So that's an example of a by right use. Um, I'll get to overlays in a minute. Of course, we'll talk about, we'll also talk about conditional zoning, which is how Matthews has processed most rezonings over about the past 40 years, um, give or take. Um, we'll also talk about post-construction, um, conforming and non-conforming. Conforming simply means that a site conforms to the current regulations that are in place. Non-conforming, means that it does not. So an example of non-conforming, a really easy one, um, the uh, Umami restaurant downtown used to be a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Whether it's setback or the fact that it has a drive-through, it's a legal non-conforming use, it means it doesn't meet the current standards for our downtown, but it was established well, well before the regulations went into place. So it's legally non-conforming. A conforming, an example of conforming would be pretty much any of the, the new buildings you saw that I shared earlier on North Trade Street. So it's a, it's a really important distinction uh, when we're looking at developments. Codes do change over time. So something, the fact that something is not conforming is not necessarily bad. It just means it doesn't meet the current standards. Administrative amendments. Uh, this is a process that's been fairly heavily used. Uh, since the UDO went into effect. Um, typically, they go either to staff, the planning board, or to your board, depending upon uh, the, the, the level of change that is desired. So and a good example is that a, a rezoning is approved. Six months goes by or a year goes by. The developer decides that, well, I was going to use a silly example. They, they need to make a minor modification to the site depending upon how minor it is, it's something that staff may say, look, here's what the ordinance says. This is not a big deal, staff level approval. 
if there are more changes as dictated by the code, I may refer it to the planning board, which in turn can either um, approve the administrative amendment or they may forward it to your board um, for board decisions. So it's an option to make a, a tweak to a previously approved zoning case without every little change triggering a whole new rezoning process, which is long and costly and um, takes up a lot of time and energy and money. <clears throat> so we, we do process rezonings on a, I'm sorry, administrative amendments on a somewhat regular basis. The most recent one I think was Williams Road, the board approved for the small subdivision. Uh, traffic impact analysis. Um, this is just looking at, you know, existing and future impacts of a development and, and potential road improvements or, or pedestrian mobility improvements need to be uh, in effect. Built upon area simply just means how much how much stuff is on a site, you know, how, how much what we call uh, impervious area is on a property. That's the, that's the built upon area. So if you've got a, uh, a one acre site, what percentage of that site is covered by buildings and parking and other areas that can't soak up stormwater. Subdivisions, um, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Here's one that's confusing sometimes, variances and public improvement variances. A typical zoning variance in Matthews goes before the Board of Adjustment. That is when a property owner is requesting to do something otherwise not allowed in our development code. So it could be a, a setback issue or, or some, they're requesting relief from a requirement in the code. The Board of Adjustment is quasi-judicial, so they make findings based on statute and then render a decision for whether a property owner gets variance or not. Public improvement variances, however, are not quasi-judicial. They come to your board and they mostly relate to um, pro development or they completely relate to development proposals. They could relate to a street width or whether to have a sidewalk or not, street trees, um, uh, maybe a site layout requirement in the, in the Unified Development Ordinance, but those will always uh, come to you uh, for a final vote. Those do not go to the Board of Adjustment. So just the fact that it says variance, there's two different types of variances. And then swim buffers. I've got an example of those in just a moment here. All right, so back to overlay districts. As I said earlier, all properties are located in a zoning district. Some properties are also located in uh, an overlay district. These overlay districts, um, we'll say they supersede the requirements of the underlying zoning district. Um, one example, and you'll see here this area in green, you probably recognize this is the downtown overlay. Uh, we have the additional requirements for building placement, parking placement. Uh, we have some architectural standards for new buildings in the downtown overlay. Uh, reduced setbacks, things of that nature. So um, if a standard setback is 40 feet so that the building can be no closer than 40 feet to the front property line, the downtown overlay actually relaxes that. It says, well, we want this to feel more like a downtown. So it's maybe closer to 20 feet. Um, so it's, it's a extra set of requirements over a group of properties. And um, they have their pros and cons, but generally they allow you to apply uh, a, an overarching set of regulations to an area that may have very distinct zoning districts. So you, you don't necessarily have to go through and rezone everything to the same zoning. You may not want every property in that overlay to have the same zoning. For instance, this is the Highway 51 overlay in purple. It's obviously a large area, very distinctive. Some of it's residential, some's more commercial. So you've got these different zoning districts, but they all needed to be knitted together in some way uh, to ensure that we had more of a parkway feel uh, along that, that new road alignment when it was put in place 30 years ago. So those are, those are just overlays real briefly explained. Um, I think we now have, I think we have three in town because we did enact the ENT district overlay a couple of years ago as well. Jay, um... For the benefit, particularly of our two new commissioners, can you uh, give an example of something that was built by right? Because a lot of times uh, we'll get, as mayor and commissioners, we'll get emails from angry citizens 
uh, saying, well, why did you allow XYZ to be built? And it was built by right, which means we had nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm struggling to think of an example, but. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a, a good example that uh, folks could point to. We, we have a lot of conditional zoning in town. So a lot of projects are going through the rezoning process. Um, one example that pops in mind to me is adjacent to the Harris Teeter headquarters on Matthews Mail Road. Um, when I first came to work here, it was an older self-storage facility, had a really deep setback, some large trees, and the owner at the time came in and built the, the row of metal mini storages right up on Matthews Mail Road. And we had so many um, complaints yeah. came into the department yeah. about, gosh, this is a travesty. It's, it's, it's so ugly. I can't believe this happened. Well, it's, it's by right zoning. You know, they, they had the ability to do that. We, we, we yeah. didn't have an overlay in place to stop it. Yeah, that's a good example. So um, <laughs> you undoubtedly as a commissioner will get an email from time to time where, where citizens are complaining about something that may have not ever come to the board for approval. Yeah, a, a lot of places of worship around town. Uh, the cutoff is generally 400 accommodations for 400 capacity in, in the primary um, meeting area. If it's under 400 and the site's, I think, at least two acres and it fronts on a thoroughfare, um, that's by right. So a lot, a lot of the, the um, churches and other uh, places of worship that you see around town were, were built by right. The, the larger facilities, um, Matthews United Methodist, for example, have gone through a zoning to the residential institutional district. Jay, another example is the uh, closed down Exxon station. That's gonna get redeveloped and mm -hmm. that, they have the right to do that. And we, we may not like it where it's conditional zoning. We'd have a lot more, the board would have a lot more input into what they wanted to see there. That's a, that's a great contemporary example, Hazen. Um, it, it will have to conform to the layout requirements, uh, architectural requirements. You know, the parking will be in the back, but uh, you know, we don't have a, for example, we don't have a two-story minimum requirement uh, in town. And, and, and do we want a, a requirement that buildings be at least two stories? I mean, Renfro Hardware is one story. People really like the buildings. So th these are all, um, I think things that come up in the planning process and, you know, and when we update our downtown plan soon, you know, that that's an example of something we may want to relook at. But Jay, if you remember though, a lot of the buildings in the main street corridor were two floors. Everybody mm -hmm. likes the historical feel of downtown, but when a building was two floors and it burnt, they never rebuilt it. So the character right. of downtown is really more two floors than one. It is, it is. So if that's something that, uh, you know, is, that's a charge that we need to look at, we'll certainly be happy to look at that. All right. So again, here's, here's the slide on uh, by right. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, anything with a P indicates permitted. PC means prescribed conditions. So that is saying, yes, uh, you can that use is allowed in the district, but there are some additional requirements. For instance, this first one here, accessory apartment. Matthews has allowed, uh, well, you commonly hear them called ADUs or accessory dwelling units. That, that's a common term now, but we've allowed these for, I think about a decade now. Um, we're saying, look, it's fine. You can do that in any of our residential districts, but go to this section of the UDO for the actual requirements. So when you get there, it says, you know, maximum of 750 square feet, can't be more than 50% of the, uh, the floor area of the dwelling unit, so on and so forth. So um, same thing for cell towers. We may have a permitted, but go to this part of the UDO and read, go on to read six or eight pages worth of requirements for, for the installation of the cell tower. So that's, that's um, where, and then and, and another example, um, a dwelling, dwelling one family detached, permitted no questions asked as long as you meet the dimensional standards you can you can build that home in that district all right so some items that that come up on a very frequent basis during the development process uh water and water quality um and and this is um 
I know Susan's on the call, so I'm hoping I got this all right. This is a planner talking about things that are very engineering related, but in my mind, I break them out into water quantity and water quality. So when you think about water quantity, it's the image up in the upper right. That's our stormwater facilities. That's where when there's a heavy rain, that's where the, the water's held until it's discharged. Water quality is relating obviously to um, the quality of the water. Um, You'll, you'll see swim buffers referenced a lot. And I've got an example here. This is a snippet from Polaris. This is a, a stream buffer or swim buffer along a creek here in Matthews. Um, those were put in place in 2000 to protect our creeks and streams in Mecklenburg County. So it's a countywide ordinance, strongly um, regulates the area uh, adjacent to the, uh, the, the uh, stream banks. They may be 35 feet from Carolina Creek or even 50 or more, um, but typically no disturbances or, or minimal disturbances allowed. Um, you might could create a perpendicular crossing for a street or a bridge or something, but the, the idea was that we can't have people doing grading work because you, you need the natural surface along the banks of the creek and stream to filter water. Like that's what vegetation does. It helps filter runoff before it uh, gets into our creeks and streams. So swim buffers are very important. Um, and then the post-construction ordinance. Uh, in fact, we've got an item on the agenda about mitigation later on, some funds that, that came to the town uh, through a payment, but that uh, really uh, relates to pollution from runoff and an effort that's been in place since 2007 to uh, mitigate the, the impacts of new development with uh, pollution controls. Uh, Jay, mm -hmm. before we leave this subject, um, I haven't heard much mentioned in the previous few years about uh, permeable pavement uh, requirements and new developments. Uh, what do we have in place to make that a requirement or a consideration? So it, it, is, uh, it is an option uh, for developments. I'm not very well qualified to talk about some of the pros and cons. That would be CJ or Susan, but I can tell you that there are increased costs uh, and maintenance associated with it. Um, the only facility I'm aware of that the town has done is the fire station. Some of that parking lot is uh, permeable pavement. Um, I was thinking also, more, more requirement of uh, new developers. I, I would have to do some research on whether it's a it's a compulsory in any communities or whether it's just an option. Um, we've, we've not done that research. Because that would really help to increase water quality and also run off, mitigate runoff. <laughs> Thank you. If you look mm -hmm. into that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so this is this is the big one here. Um, this is where you see most of our uh, folks in the department before your board on uh, Mondays, the conditional zoning process. Um, typically happens or always happens rather when a property owner or developer seeks to change zoning. The board at your discretion can accept zonings that do not have conditions. So you always see that CD uh, behind um, property. So you'll see R15 CD or B1 CD. You have the ability to rezone with no conditions, but it really limits the ability for the board to even talk about the rezoning because there are no guarantees. You, you can't put requirements on open space preservation or how dense the site is going to be. It's just, look, we're going to rezone it to business and we're going to move on. Um, the town's done a handful since I've been here, maybe one or two. Uh, but typically there are conditions attached to any rezoning because it, it does tend to give the community um, a, a better sense of comfort that they understand what kind of development is going to come if the zoning is approved. Um, I looked back at our files. We've done over 700 cases since the early 80s. Some of the early zonings like Windsor Square and even the hospital when it was zoned were conditional only or C. Um, they didn't have a zoning category attached. Um, uh, we've since moved on from that and been working with property owners for more than a decade to try to update those, uh, those zonings to more contemporary categories. Jay, are you going to touch on the, oh, I think you are, the voluntary nature of these things? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's good. No, it's perfect. Um, we've, 
plans, uh, they can be what, what I've got in the first bullet point here, site specific or more generalized. Sometimes we'll call that a bubble plan. It may just be a, uh, a series of um, like parcels and call outs says, well, this use may occur here. More often than not, they're a little bit site specific. So they give uh, your board and, and staff and the community a feeling for what the general layout is going to be, where these driveways, building, parking areas, et cetera, are going to be. Um, it's not to say bubble plans don't happen. They're oftentimes speculative. So Mark, you talked about employment earlier. You could have a developer that says, look, I, I'd, I'd like to attract uh, an office user to the site. I don't really know what how big the building, you know, I have an idea of how big the building is, but I don't know where exactly it's going to go. I don't know what their needs are going to be. Um, so we don't want a site specific plan, but we'll agree to come back later and talk and for uh, architectural or site plan approval. That's one that the board um, sees on a fairly regular basis. So those are two kind of general options for the site plan itself. Um, you have fairly broad discretion uh, with regard to conditions, but as Hazen was just bringing up, the applicant always has to agree to these conditions. And as of the uh, inaction of 160D, the, um, the applicant also has to sign off on the conditions. So after the board votes to approve the zoning, Shana sends a document to the, uh, the petitioner or developer, and they actually sign off that they agree to all the conditions that were included during the zoning process. So I, that's one of the changes in 160D that I like because there's a lot of last minute wheeling and dealing sometimes as we're trying to get these things across the finish line and it, it gives everyone a better understanding. Uh, there in blue are just some, some very typical um, standards you'll see in the conditional notes, uses being the main one, but also architectural transportation and so on and so forth. Um, this last bullet point, and I don't think, Charlie's not on the call, is he? I don't think he's with us right now. Um, Conditions should generally be related to the property and those that are surrounding it. Um, in, in planning terminology, though, it's, it's typically what we'd call a rational nexus. There has to be some connection to the zoning. Um, we had a developer some years ago that said, well, I'll, I'll just make a, a donation to your downtown group to get this project approved. And, and we said, no, 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 no. You, 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 can't, you can't just throw money at the community just to get a project across the finish line. So there, there has to be some general connection um, uh, to conditions that, that are placed on the property. This is just a typical plan. This is the Lidl that's since been constructed. Um, you see street, and in this, I know the scale is hard to see, but you'll typically see street layouts, uh, street improvements called out building placement, uh, sometimes landscaping, depending upon if that's been a major point of conversation during the zoning, uh, your parking layout, stormwater, um, buffers from adjoining properties. So these are just some of the, the broad categories that you'll see called out in site plans. Um, this is just a typical notes page. So as you're reviewing zoning petitions that they come in, we, we require site development data. So this is just a summary of everything going on. They wanted to go from R15 to B1CD. Uh, a 32 foot building height was committed to, uh, and then a maximum building area of 40,000 feet. Now, one distinction to make, your board can always down-regulate. So if the maximum building height's 40 feet, the developer can say, look, I won't even do 40, I'll do 32, but you can't approve something in conflict with the code. You can't say, well, we really like this development, we'll let you have 60 feet. If it doesn't conform to the code, it's not a legal rezoning. So just keep that in mind. It's not a, it's not, it's not a free for all. When you go through the conditional zoning process, you still have to meet standard. So I have to give credit on this slide. Uh, Nadine Bennett in our office put this together and it's a, it's a summary of our conditional zoning process. And actually it was something that Renee had asked me about, oh, I don't know, a year plus ago about some way to kind of better describe uh, how our process works. But this is on our website. It's available for uh, citizens or developers to look at the process. And this is where it, you know, from start to finish, uh, from pre-application meeting with staff to kind of share hey, I have this big idea, I wanna build 
well, let's just talk about what we hear a lot about today. I want to build a new multifamily development. Well, we're getting out the land use plan and you know, we're looking at, okay, what does the plan dictate? What are the uses that are called out in this land use plan? But this is also where we're just having general conversations. Look, you might want to think about this. We've approved a lot of multifamily projects lately. You know, you, here, here's some things that you need to think about. If they get to the, pro, the point in the process where they want to submit, yes, you have an application submittal. Um, you're assigned a, uh, a staff planner that's your main point of contact. As, as you've heard in this process, there's a community meeting that's required. Um, we're legally required to do a public hearing notice. So Charlie publishes that in the newspaper. Uh, we post the, sign, the Z sign that you see around town and we do a mailing notification. Uh, one change on the community meeting that we enacted, is that in 2020 or 2021, uh, we record the community meetings. There's an audio recording provided to us as well as part of that community meeting process. You're all familiar with the public hearings. This is the opportunity for staff to prevent present our staff reports. Uh, you hear from the developer and then um, opportunity for the public to uh, make comment on the plans. It is then referred to the planning board who by statute have to review uh, the rezoning within 30 days of the public hearing. And then finally back to your board for a potential final decision. So that's uh, three to six months and, and one slide here with eight stops. Okay, I have to make a joke here. Everybody at the bottom, the little Z's, that means they're all falling asleep. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that. Okay. Well, we, we don't want to put them to sleep at planning board. That's a, that's a, they do good work on planning board. I want everybody awake. We'll, we'll get them some coffee. All right, so we've got a little over half an hour left. I'm gonna to try to get through. I think we're, we're doing pretty well in time. Talk a little bit about current planning and then um, real briefly touch on the kind of trends and things. I know you all, some of you have seen this presentation already. Uh, recent work, we're really, really happy with how the Eastern Gateway plan um, turned out. Uh, I think this is gonna give some really great guidance when these uh, development proposals do come in. And, and actually I believe you're, you're accepting a new rezoning for a portion of this already this evening on the consent agenda. Um, updates to the um, TIA requirements. Uh, I mentioned earlier 160D, um, the mobility study from about 20, I guess that was finished in 2020 and the streetscape master plan. Some examples of the work we've done recently. All right, if you're not familiar with our portion of the, uh, the town's website, the snapshot here, when you go to planning and development, two treasure troves of information here. Pending zoning, this is where all of our development cases live, whether it's a ministry of amendment, a subdivision that's coming in. So there are some things there that may or may not be coming to your board. So, so it's not, not everything is going to be on the council agenda. We also keep um, completed zoning and development cases going back at least to 2010, I think. So I think we've got about 12 years of zoning cases um, online for the community to uh, access. We've also um, digitized, um, I think all of our rezonings now. I mean, Hazen, we were really close last time I checked with Shana, but I think we've got everything digitized now. So if a, a citizen or, or someone has a, an interest in, you know, a file from 1992, we've, we can get a PDF of, of it pretty quickly rather than having to dig it out of the file drawer and um, you know, try to get it scanned and over to them. So it also makes our, our life easier, but that, that's a, a great resource right there. And then of course, uh, um, maps, the UDO, all of our development plans, um, everything's kind of summarized in this, this one section of the town's website. So a couple of things that are uh, sort of on the drawing board. Um, as most of you know, we're partnering with um, the Urban Institute on the affordable housing report. So excited to be working on that. Um, hoping to get our first uh, stakeholder meeting scheduled um, for 335 East Matthews. That's the property the town owns, just one lot up from town hall. Um, I, was, I had been hoping to do an in-person meeting, but, you know, Omicron's got different plans for us now, so we may be pivoting to a virtual stakeholder meeting on that, but uh, stay tuned. 
Um, of course, we've got the lot on Matthew Station Street that's coming back to your board in uh, two weeks. That's part of the Matthews um, Station downtown development. Um, the text amendments I mentioned earlier, and you're going to hear a little bit from Nadine Bennett on micromobility this evening. Um, we've had a few internal conversations about some of the bigger picture items that we would like to tackle soon. Um, our downtown plan hit 10 years uh, really quickly, and we were looking at how to um, do a broad update of that document, but also kind of look holistically at some of these other documents. Is there a way to simplify it for, for, um, for the end user to make it a little bit easier to understand? Uh, the big one here, I'll, I'll continue to do plugs on um, a new comprehensive plan. And I knew um, a couple of you attended the training the school government put on um, back in, what, I think it was November or December, I think it was November. There was a, a mention on comp plans and what is considered up to date. Um, Adam Lovelady tended to feel that 10 years is fairly long in the tooth for a fast growing community like Matthews. So um, that is something that, that I will continue to push for um, as planning director that, that we desperately need to update our, our, our comp plan to reflect uh, the rapid change happening in our community. Um, and then future area plans, corridor studies, uh, you know, out at CPCC, um, Levine campus, uh, Hendrick Automotive owns uh, close to 200 acres. It's been slated for an auto mall, which may never be built. Uh, this is also potentially the terminus of the Silver Line. Um, we need to update our Monroe Road area plan to reflect the alignment of the Silver Line and maybe start looking at some station area planning. And then uh, corridor studies, the area I mentioned earlier on, on Matthews Mint Hill Road between downtown and the ENT district. I think that's that's an area that's probably ripe for a, a corridor study to look at how we can ensure that that's, uh, that area continues to, to develop out in a way that, that makes sense for that part of our community. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because I think you're all mostly familiar with these. I just pulled a, a, a few of the recent zoning cases that you all may get questions about as dirt might start moving soon. Uh, this was the Goodwin Homes uh, rezoning on Pleasant Plains Road that started out as a, a, a duplex project and ended up as a single family. Uh, this is located just across from uh, Brightmore, the small infill development with uh, 10 lots. Uh, this is an image that unless you've clicked through the agenda this evening, you may not have seen it. This is the two capital partners project uh, that uh, is coming back before your board for uh, elevation approval. Uh, so you'll, you'll see this image later this evening. And then uh, I believe it's been uh, branded the Arden Matthews. This is uh, the age restricted development adjacent to the Lidl on Ida Wild Road. Um, that isn't permitting right now too. So that is a trend that, that I've seen um, since the, at least since the pandemic started that you know, capital is still flowing and, and there's, there's uh, developers are really, they're not sitting on projects for a year or two. Things are going to permitting much quicker than they used to after zoning approval. So uh, for instance, the Eden Hall development on Fullwood was approved eight years ago and they're just finaling that out. You know, there's, there's still some work that needs to be done in the right of way before we accept the streets, but eight years is a really long time for a 75 unit project that I think in today's market, you might cut that in half or less uh, for, for build out. Um, up, upcoming and anticipated zoning cases. Uh, a few of these are on your consent agenda for this evening. Um, Matthews Village is, is, as I mentioned, a portion of the Eastern Gateway Plan. Um, we've got a zoning for the old uh, medical waste incinerator site and the steel drum recycling facility on Campus Ridge that's coming in for very rare I-2. Uh, request. Um, one of the uh, ENT district uh, sites, it's a multifamily and mixed use project on Sports Parkway that is currently in process as a public hearing next month. The former Wingate Common site and by Lat Purser on um, John Street and 485 has had a few false starts, but uh, we, ex we expect that to be submitted later this month. And then the site plan you see here is for a uh, couple of out parcels on Samuel at Highway 51 for a uh, restaurant and bank. Hey, did you define ENT or do you think already? I think good catch. The, the entertainment district, uh, which is the, that is the zoning district put in place for the area around the sportsplex. So there is an 
entertainment district, uh, area plan, there's a zoning district, overlay, what else have I missed? Um, but that, that's, that's the area that the town has worked with the county on for well over two decades now to, to create this um, kind of dynamic um, mixed use area that joins the 180 acre sportsplex. All right, so these are uh, just some thoughts I had on, on um, really just food for thought for you all as, as you uh, move into the beginning of your, your term here as commissioners and what are some things, and, and I, don't, I don't mean for this to sound, some of these items may sound kind of dire, but they are challenges that, that we will have to address. Some we have more control over, some we don't. Um, a slide on market trends here. I'm just doing some some up to date research. We're still at uh, we're as of now a top five state for in migration. So we had close to 100,000 um, new residents in North Carolina in 2020. As you know, Charlotte's a hot housing market. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's this weird push and pull. So as traffic congestion increases, places like Matthews seem comparatively urban when you look at it in the context of moving down. Uh, to Indian Trail or Stallings or Monroe or Marshville, for instance. So we're only 10 to 12 miles from downtown Charlotte, and we're really a, a first or second tier suburb of, uh, of, of Center City, Charlotte. So people are attracted to Matthews due to that um, kind of perfect mix of uh, more relaxed uh, suburban community, but yet proximity to the amenities that the, the greater Charlotte area offers. Um, you know, continued job growth and still cheaper housing are still attracting people here. So I know our housing prices may seem wild, but compared to other markets in the country, they're viewed to newcomers as still a deal. Um, so that that's also having an impact on the community. Um, walkability, uh, you know, study after study, they're too numerous to name, have indicated this is what people are looking for. And the concept of the 15 minute city has really gained a lot of momentum. It's just a, a, a modern interpretation of a traditional design that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, we kept uh, this concept of a, a walkable activity center in place when we designed the gateway plan that you've got recreation, some employment opportunities, some, some shopping may be limited and um, the ability to kind of live life potentially without having to always rely on on your car for your everyday needs and and i'll i know you you all have a copy of this i'm not going to read everything on the slide but what if you have any takeaways this quote that i have here um from the national association of realtors says it all this is not crazy planners telling society how you know you should live your life or how you should build your communities this this is a a, a realtor association that says look 50% of respondents says they would give up their single family house if, if they could walk more. So I, I really do think we have an imbalance in society today where we aren't, we don't have, we've, we've built out since World War II, this really automotive dominated society where everything's spread out, you need a car for everything, but people do want the environment that we unfortunately mostly only provide in and around downtown Matthews. And, and a few other pockets within the community. But um, I found that that quite interesting. And this idea of a 15 minute city, you see this, this uh, triangle here that's sort of been inverted where um, it, it takes private car trips and kind of um, relegates those to an as needed and, and puts more emphasis on walking and cycling. Uh, market trends, I, I pulled this from a, a Charlotte Growth Trends report that, that uh, was done alongside their new comprehensive plan. And the, the darker, I'll call those shades of green you see are residential building permits. And this little line right here, this is generally Matthews in this corner of town. And, and I know that it seems like development has been happening at a really breakneck speed. But if you look, this is the blue line here, these really dark shades of green, this is all a tremendous amount of building permitting going on. This is Huntersville up here, this dark here. This is out, out by the river, uh, I guess kind of Steel Creek area. So, you know, compared to other parts of Mecklenburg County, I think our growth has still been 
relatively moderate, even if it feels like there's development going on all around us. It's just, I, I thought this was a good um, perspective slide to kind of point out that there's still a really, really heavy amount of uh, growth going on elsewhere in Mecklenburg County. Just a few of the things, and this is where maybe it seems a little dire, but uh, some of the, the issues that, that we're gonna be facing um, as time marches on here. Um, so the growth pressures we're seeing, it, it, it feels to us in the planning department that if, if there is land that's available, it's in play. Either developers are trying to obtain it or landowners are trying to sell it. You know, it's a really good market and it, it feels like the town is really rapidly running out of developable land. You know, we, we've reached probably a threshold where 15 to 20% of the land in, in Matthews is what we would call greenfield, which this this uh, image here, that's greenfield, meaning it's never been developed before, or undeveloped, un underdeveloped land, that's greenfield. There's not a lot of greenfield land. Um, you know, redevelopments like the old movie theater uh, out on, on 74, um, I think that's going to become more common in the future. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a tough place to be, honestly, to be in a, such a fast-growing region, but be a community that's already built out so much of its land. And, and this is, you know, I thought I had when I was putting this together, and, and I called it growth imbalance, but historically, Matthews had a mix, uh, and, and it was naturally occurring, right? Family dollar turned into this huge Fortune 500 company. They just happened to be in our backyard. You know, here's Teeter grew and had their headquarters still, still today, but it's subsidiary now. But our, our mix of non-residential residential was, um, we weren't what, what planners call bedroom community. Bedroom communities are places that have very little employment and everyone has to commute out of the town for their, for their uh, place of work. You know, Matthews actually had industry and, and jobs what we're seeing that has slowly happened is yes, you know, the retail built out in 74 in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, we've got plenty of shopping centers, but with the, the kind of decline of brick and mortar retail that you hear about, more and more people using online commerce, there's just not the demand that there used to be for shopping centers. I mean, they're being built, but just not to the level that they were 20 years ago. And our, our markets, you know, we've, we've done, um, we've done some market reports in the past, uh, Gosh, Hazen, the one we did, and the name's escaping, the one we did in 2007, um, not Carnes, what was the oh. name? We, we've referenced it a lot. It's, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyways, uh, we, we've done some economic studies in the past that, that looked at our market. And uh, right now, we've really um, evolved to be a, a medical market from an office perspective. The Warren Report? The Warren Report. Thank you. Warren. Thank you, Frank Warren. Yeah. And, you know, Frank's always willing to come back. I mean, he's a great guy. If we ever wanted him back for a little refresh or just something to, you know, very insightful person, he's still local in Charlotte. I'm sure he'd come back. But, uh, you know, I had, I had to throw a little bit of clip art in here, just looking at, okay, I see four major types of development. You've got your industrial, retail, residential office. The, the uh, hospitals really led to a, uh, it's been a growth magnet for medical, but, you know, traditional employment, like getting a regional headquarters or something of that nature has been really, really elusive since I've been here. And I've heard everything from, well, Valentine's just too big to you're just too, a little too far from the airport. And why would I locate in Matthews if I could be off Providence Road or in Valentine or, or the new river district that's under, that's soon going to be under construction uh, near the airport. So, okay. yes, sir. Uh, I heard something about uh, expansion with Novant. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is that? So they, they've announced there was a press release that said that uh, there's going to be a new bed tower built and some other improvements. It was a $169 million project is what I remember seeing in the press release. Is that on the campus where it's at now? Yes. Okay. And, and, you know, just the other thing to talk, I mean, they're a great employer, but the directly associated with the hospital, they do not play, pay property tax. They're exempt from property tax. I think that they pay a little bit hazen on the office building, and that's, that's it. Correct. But the vast majority, I would say 90-ish percent of that site is tax exempt. 
but that really the the uh, the point of the slide is if you've got available land, what's going to go on it? That you're you're seeing uh, what the market wants right now, and it, it's a we have a housing crunch, so that's why you're seeing so heavily uh, such a heavy uh, push for residential property in the town. I talked a little bit about uh, uh, land scarcity, and you know, Mark, you were mentioning office a little earlier. Um, this the last line there: lack of available land may hinder future economic development opportunities. So. It, it's tough from a property rights perspective. You know, the town may say, look, we think that's better as office in a few years, but you may have a property owner that says, look, I'm ready to sell my land now. So there's there's that push pull with property rights and, and planning and what happens on a specific piece of property. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you will see more of a push for infill development um, as land values rise. There's a good example going on right down the road at the Arboretum, which is not that far away. Uh, some 25 or 30 year old bank branches are being torn down for a uh, Publix with a parking deck and some associated development. So that's a, that's a big suburban infill project just around the corner from us. We've, your, your board's talked at length about home affordability. So this, this is not a slide I need to spend much time on, but as we saw in, in the earlier snapshot, we, we do have some growing issues with uh, cost burden in the community. And again, the, the, the economic prosperity of the Charlotte region is really driving uh, a lot of that. Uh, competition, I think it's, it's always good uh, to keep an eye out for what's going on around you. You know, just, there are communities making big investments in civic spaces like parks. This is a, a snapshot of the new downtown park that uh, Cary's putting in place. Um, downtown redevelopment projects, uh, large scale economic development projects. I'm not saying that, that we should go out tomorrow and let's find this um, projects is gonna change the town. It's gonna fix everything, but it's, it's always good to keep in mind you know, what's going on with, uh, with your neighbors. Um, this is downtown Kannapolis, which I've talked about at length, that I think just being from this region, watching this turnaround from this mill town that, you know, the mill closed and was, was imploded about 20 years ago. It's been a really amazing transformation um, that this community has gone through over a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, another item is looking at things like our housing stock. You know, most neighborhoods in Matthews don't provide some of the same amenities that that um, newer developments on the fringe of the Charlotte region do, like you know, the big neighborhood activity centers and water parks and things of that nature. But as Hayes and I were talking about a week or two ago, you know, the, the emphasis on trail development in town. I mean, that is an amenity that's maybe not provided by the homeowners association, but it's how we link this community together and, and you know feel really strongly that we need to continue um, the, the good work that's been going on here. So, you know, congestion, I was listening to Chief Pennington talk about how many cars come through the town daily, and I think he said 200,000, which is a, it's amazing. We have about 30,000 residents, so it really says a lot about where the traffic comes from. We hear, you know, if there's a rezoning, we hear at public hearings, well, you, you know, board, you shouldn't approve this 12 unit project because it's going to create traffic congestion. Well, it may create some additional traffic, but at the end of the day, you know, most of our traffic doesn't originate from in the town. It's passed through traffic. Um, some of these are, are issues that, um, you know, th there's not an answer. The region will continue to go around us, right? But it does affect at the end of the day, it can have uh, an impact on the desirability of community, you know, air, noise, pollution, things of that nature. And finally, when you look at it from a planning perspective, how much do you want to let cars dominate your built environment? Um, the big push right now, and I know some some of the um, folks I work with are kind of tired of hearing me um, harp on this, but every restaurant chain in America now wants a drive through And it used to just be like, well, McDonald's has one, Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, but now the sub shop chains, you know, Chipotle, every restaurant since the pandemic started is saying, we want a drive-through. And it's really, when you talk about walkable places, they tend to look less like this image you have here, which I just thought was sort of comical. That, that's about 30 people trying to get a cup of coffee and it created a, a traffic jam. Um, 
And finally, uh, I think this might be my last slide, tree canopy. Um, that, that's, you know, Charlotte had at one time set their 50 by 50 goal, which they're finding really hard to achieve. But th there are ways that you can be more creative with development. And this is uh, a concept that's been around for quite some time now. It's called a conservation subdivision. And it's, it's, these two images are the same density. The difference being that the homes are on very, very small lots and open space is permanently preserved um, in um, woodlands surrounding the neighborhood. So instead of giving everybody, you know, one acre lots, you permanently preserve the land and you don't depend on, or rather don't hope that, you know, folks don't come in and cut the trees down in the backyard that were preserved. So I think, yes, I think that's it. So I'm gonna stop share right now. A very quick question. Uh, I don't know if Charlie needs to be here for it, uh, Buckley, but uh, moratoriums is uh, infrastructure such as sewage, water, et cetera. Are they legitimate reasons for moratoriums? They are. If there's limited sewer capacity, as an example, you can do um, moratoriums and you may have to be a limited and you may have to show how you're going to study the issue and address the issue. It just can't be arbitrary. That would be my advice. Jake, did you have a different thought? No, I, I mean, I can provide you the, the statute uh, to, to confirm that, but, you know, Charlie's been asked this question in the past and the answer has just been, you can always say no, right? I mean, you, you can put a moratorium in place, but the way the town zoning is structured right now, there are very few opportunities for what we talked about by right earlier. There's not just places all over town where somebody could come in and build two or 300 you know, multifamily units. Like they're almost always going to go through a rezoning process. Yeah, I'd like to know what uh, conditions are legally, um, can, can uh, be legally uh, institute a moratorium, in other words, other than sewage and, and, uh, and water. Yeah, we'll get to that. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Jay? All right, let's take a brief break and we'll get back we'll together. Give Jay a round of applause for uh, Thank you, Jay. Good job. Good job. Appreciate it. Uh, Always happy to. I think I've uh, told, shared with uh, Commissioner uh, Hoover and Tafano that. For me, and I think everybody that's elected official, this is probably the most uh, comprehensive list of stuff that you got to learn that most most of us don't know if you're, unless you're a professional in this industry. So um, it, it took me, honestly, a, a few years to become really uh, where, I, where I felt I was you know, minimally competent with <laughs> all the zoning stuff. So it's a very good uh, presentation, Jay. We appreciate it. Glad to. Thank you. All right. Let's come back in a few. All right, thank you, Jay.
Rob, you have your hand raised. Do you need something? No, I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry. That's okay. If you hit it again, it'll go down. Oh, okay. Or maybe not. Jennifer Dillahara, do you have a question? Yes, I'm just wondering if you can see me because on my end, it looks more like a webinar session than it is. We will bring you over when the public comment period opens up on the agenda and you can turn your you'll be visible then. If you're Perfect. I, I completely understand now. Thank you so much. Appreciate you're your welcome. help. Absolutely. All right, board members, it is 6.59. Please start making your way back and turn your cameras on. Hey, Charlie, good to see you up and well. Good evening. Thank you very much. Hope you're well. Yes, I am. Thank you. Good. Good to hear. <clears throat> hey, Charlie. Is it cold up there? Is it cold in Mooresville? <laughs> yes, sir. It's cold out <laughs> here, too. But you know, the temperature is not too bad. It just feels cold. It's just a real solid feeling of coldness to it. Yeah, I guess we need it because we were so warm back here in November. Exactly. If we want to escape mosquitoes, we got to have freezing. That's right. <laughs> we ready to begin, Lori? Yes, sir. All right. Welcome to our January 10th 
Matthew's Board of Commissioners meeting. I'd like to start with some introductions. Tonight we have Town Attorney Charlie Buckley, uh, Town Clerk Lori Canapino, Commissioner Mark Tafano, Mayor Pro Tem Ken McCool, Commissioner Larry Whitley, Commissioner, Commissioner Gina Hoover, Commissioner Renee Garner, Town Manager Hazen Blodgett, Assistant Town Manager Becky Hawk, Planning Director Jay Camp, Commissioner John Urban, I saw him wave a, a moment ago, our Communications Coordinator Maureen Keith, and our Fire Chief Rob Kinnenberg. I'd like to remind everyone, due to the spike of COVID-19 cases in the region, this meeting of the Matthews Board of Commissioners will be held once again remotely. Area commissioners will vote on each item by roll call vote. Meaning each member will be polled, individually state their vote for the record. They will also raise their hand or otherwise visually indicate how they're voting. So we'd like to start tonight with an uh, invocation from Mayor Pro Tem McCool. Thank you. Uh, tonight I'm going to share a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. This quote is relevant twofold. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday is next Monday, and I feel like this quote kind of applies to us in our meeting tonight. It's a very short quote as well. The time is always right to do what is right. Tonight, let us remember that we are here to serve the people of Matthews and make good decisions on behalf of them, and let us try to do right by all as we make our decisions for the town tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for that. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, uh, Larry, do you want to, Commissioner Whitley, would you like to uh, tell us about the Martin Luther King events upcoming? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, on next Sunday, the 16th, uh, we will be gathering at Mount Moriah. It's the five churches and any citizens who want to join for uh, a peaceful march. Uh, at 2.30 gathering, we'll probably start to march somewhere around about uh, 210. And we're going to, this year, instead of walking up uh, Matthews Mayhill Road, we're going to utilize the new Crestdale Heritage Trail. And so we're going to go through our parking lot and come out the upper end and then uh, utilize the trail with all the historical markings on it. Meet at Town Hall somewhere around 3, 3 or 5. And then we'll have about a 30, 35 minute program. Uh, the mayor is going to welcome us there and along with uh, a couple of other speakers. Uh, we're very fortunate this year that Martin Luther King is going to award two scholarships. $2,500 to a minority uh, child that is going off to college. And we're very excited that we, this is the first time we ever awarded two, which is uh, $5,000 or $2,500 each. And uh, we, that will take place on, and one of the recipients will speak at the steps on that Sunday evening. The other one will speak at Monday at the worship service at 10 o'clock at Mount Moriah. We asked you to wear a mask. You certainly we would like for you to be a part of that. We got great social distance. We allow 150 people, first come, first serve, but there's great distance in there. And then the second one was speak at that time. Our guest, the mayor will do a welcome there as well too, but our guest speaker for Martin Luther King is the pastor, First Baptist Church, uh, Justin Buchanan. It's really excited and looking forward to having a great time with you as well too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitley. This is uh, something that uh, elected officials have uh, historically participated in, and it's a really great event uh, for the whole community to come together. So if you're available uh, either on Sunday or Monday or both, uh, we'd love to see you out there. We'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. We can get our virtual flag. There it is. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jay. Move on to agenda item number four, receive a COVID-19 update from Chief Kennenberg. Chief. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, <clears throat> this report uh, 
combines information as recent received as recently as January the 8th. Um, based on the information available, uh, Mecklenburg County reports a seven day positive test average of 37.4% uh, on an average of 34,455 tests a day for the last seven days. Um, this goes without saying that COVID test rates have continued to rise dramatically over the last month. Uh, <clears throat> cumulative case counts of approximately 193,000 cases and 1,318 deaths countywide. Um, but really, the cumulative case count number is irrelevant at this point with so many people repeat testing, testing for school, testing for travel, testing just to feel better or know for sure whether they've got the cold or COVID, uh, case count has almost gotten lost. Um, Mecklenburg County is considered to be in high community spread based on the state standard. Again, with a seven day average of 37%, uh, locally 100 36 people are hospitalized due to COVID in the last seven days. Um, as of January the 3rd, Mecklenburg County reports that 65% of county residents, roughly 725,000, are partially vaccinated, 61,000 are fully vaccinated, and 47,000 or 47% have received boosters. Uh, the EMS system in Mecklenburg County is stressed. Medic and first responders are reporting high numbers of employees impacted by COVID. Uh, modifications to the response protocols have been implemented to reduce first responder dispatch and better utilize available ambulances for high priority transport. Uh, Matthews has implemented the CDC's modified five day isolation standards for vaccinated members who have tested for positive, who have tested positive for COVID. And we have drafted mandatory overtime policies should COVID-19 run through the department. Uh, hospitals uh, report a high emergency department patient volume and significant wait times. ICUs fortunately are underutilized, under capacity, Again, indicating that Omicron is a mild, has a milder infection impact than the previous variants. Um, public health feels that we are about two weeks from the peak impact of Omicron based on what we're seeing in New York City and in the United Kingdom. Uh, that's the end of my report. I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Have any questions, uh, Commissioner Tafano? Yes, uh, thank you, Chief, for that. Uh, can you tell me what percentage of hospitalizations and new cases are what we call breakthrough cases, people that have um, uh, COVID that have already been fully vaccinated? I, I don't have that information, Mr. Tomano. Is that published information by the Mecklenburg County Board of Health? Uh, it's not in their regular reporting matrix, no. Can you obtain a formal... Uh, announced a formal uh, proclamation from them as to why that data is not collected and also why it's not being published? I, I can ask that question, yeah. yes. Yeah, Thank I, you. so I guess the way I would couch it is, does Mecklenburg County Health Department collect that data? If they don't, uh, uh, you know. I, I, I would like to have a formal policy statement why the Mecklenburg County Board of Health either doesn't collect the data, and if they do, why don't they publish it? Well, I, I think at this point we can ask the question. I, I don't know what the response will be, but. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Garner. Chief, can you tell us a little bit more about the impact on uh, medic services? I, I read somewhere that they are bringing in National Guard to help. Um, operate ambulances, but that, is that impacting Matthews and, um, you know, and what other impacts are there? Um, medic, <clears throat> medic and Charlotte Fire have had a significant number of people out because of COVID. Um, medic has also uh, 
had a, uh, we're two years into COVID and medic is seeing large numbers of people leave the service. Um, so they are pushing people through training programs as quickly as they can. Um, the other week they had 33 people call out in a day, uh, which means they don't have 33 units, of course, across over a 24 hour period. Um, so the, the system is struggling because turnaround time at the hospital, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a piggyback system. Uh, if, if there's no beds in the ER, then the ambulances can't turn around and go back to service. If they're tied up the hospital, they have longer response times. Uh, their goal still for priority medicals is to be on scene within 12 minutes and 59 seconds, but they have downgraded lower priority medical calls, ones that do not have a high likelihood that the patient will need priority transport. In some cases, they are working under a one hour response time for very minor medical issues. Um, we're lucky that we have Novant Matthews. So we are at a receiving point. So as soon as an ambulance clears and is available in the Matthews area, if we have a call, typically they get selected for that call. And we typically have units posted up at station two. Uh, so we have not seen, although we do not track ambulance response time data, um, but we have not seen extended wait periods. We have seen out of county units respond to calls in Matthews. Um, they, Medic through emergency management has requested uh, ambulance strike teams. They requested 50 personnel. Um, my understanding is they got five units and 10 personnel. So those are picking up uh, transport calls for Medic so that we can keep the rank and file medic units circulating and in service. And I have one follow up to that. Are, are you seeing with that shortage, are you see, still seeing um, ambulances being rerouted from other areas into Matthews? I know that happened last year at one point. Uh, it seemed to clear up, but, but like ambulances from South Carolina coming into Matthews or well, is there still um, that demand? Uh, Matthews, Matthews Novant Medical Center gets a lot of patient volume from Union County. So frequently we have Union County ambulances that pick up calls for medic in the Matthews area. Uh, Pineville, uh, Atrium, Pineville, or Atri Mercy, Mercy South, Atrium, whatever you know it as, um, currently has Med One, which is a local disaster response resource set up in their parking lot to address the surge because they're seeing a high number of South Carolina patients coming to Atrium facilities in Pineville. Um, Atrium Union West opens in February. Uh, so again, some of that traffic coming from Union County to Matthews, Novant, uh, may go to Atrium Union West. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of drop off with Mint Hill, Novant, uh, but that hospital too has seen an uptick in, in ER cases. Long answer to a, it, it's a very complex system. Right, it, yeah, I appreciate the information and and I appreciate your department. I know it's getting exhausting or has gotten exhausting. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions for Chief Kenneberg? Okay, not seeing any. I uh, had the opportunity this afternoon to uh, speak to some folks that are on our next agenda item, uh, several of which were doctors. And one of the things I hadn't really thought about is a lot of the uh, hospitals, I'm, I'm being told, are suffering from their own employees getting sick. And uh, Dr. Vasant Patel was telling me about one particular hospital that had 80 beds um, unused, unavailable, because they didn't have staff to, uh, to service them. So uh, it's, it's really bad. There's a 
Juliet, there he is, Dr. Hassan Patel. Good evening, sir. So again, we'll go on to the next agenda item then, and I'd like to uh, recognize the B BAPS charities uh, for donations they made to Matthews nonprofit agencies. Uh, this afternoon, they graciously asked me to join them as we went around to uh, the Free Medical Clinic, Matthews Free Medical Clinic, uh, Habitat for Humanity, <clears throat> and the Matthews Help Center and uh, BAPS Charities uh, made very substantial donations to each of those. Uh, tonight, representing them, we have uh, MB, and I believe your wife, uh, Hema, is here as well, and Dr. Hassan Patel, and, and uh, also uh, Nihal Patel. So I'll turn it over to MB, and I, we spoke earlier this afternoon, MB, and I wonder if you could uh, give us a little background about the history of BAPS Charities. <clears throat> Uh, hi, Commissioner, Mayor, thank you for having us here. Uh, I want to appreciate the entire staff of uh, Matthews uh, Town and all the charities that who does a phenomenal job. But uh, I'll take this opportunity to introduce BAPS Charity. And I wanted to kind of uh, go in a three segment, our history, our work and our symbol. So the history is uh, the concept behind the BAPS Charities begin decades ago with the grassroots volunteerism in the South Asia, grounded in the spirit of service. As those young volunteers begin to spread across the world, BAPS charities took shape as a medium to continue, share the spirit with the new and diverse community, formally established in 2000 as a BAPS Care International. The organization changed its name to BAPS charities in 2007 and proceed to formalize the institutionalize the organization in countries across the world. Even as it has grown over the years, BAPS Charities has uh, striven to remain true to its mission of self-service. Our work uh, is divided into the five mainly area. Working in the five key areas, BAPS Charity aims to express the spirit of self-service through the health awareness, educational service, humanitarian relief, environmental protection and preservation and community empowerment. empowerment. From the walkathons or sponsored walks that raises the fund for local communities to supporting humanitarian relief in the time of urgent need or from the community health fair to sustaining the hospitals and schools in developing countries. BAPS Charities provides an opportunity for individuals wishing to serve locally and globally. And what does our symbol <clears throat> signifies? The BAPS charity as charitable working driven by an ethos of self-service empowering individual to engage in the project that better wants community, country, and the world. The, this ethos is captured by our motto, the spirit of service and our symbol of a flame resting in a crucible and representing the desire of self-service glowing in the heart of volunteers. We believe that the flame is an insightful representation of what true service is, the given of ourselves to bring the light and the warmth, hope and joy of others around us. When an individual is motivated by the spirit of service, she sacrificed for the greater good of her community and the world. So this is brief introduction of BAPS Charities. Uh, Mayor, thank you for giving us an opportunity to be a part of uh, uh, town. And uh, if uh, Dr. Wasant wants to add anything, I would uh, like him to say a few words. Sure, go ahead, Dr. Patel. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We enjoyed today um, meeting with uh, all the recipients and um, thankful to the community. I have seen uh, something special in Matthews Township. I've been coming there for worship for many years and uh, it is a special town. There's a great deal of feel. Uh, I can relate and associate to that. And it's been a privilege to work with Matthews, helping Matthews last year and the year before as well as be part of this town. Uh, truly, it's a selfless service that you guys also provide. I've seen it 
Uh, and I think there's a, a great deal of uh, symbiotic relationship between BAPS charities and a lot of what the organizations within Matthews, the churches and others do uh, for the community. And we're just blessed to be part of uh, you all. I think it's been a privilege to uh, continue to do this and we'll do more of it. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go on to uh, each of the uh, nonprofits that received a, a donation today from, from BAPS Charities, I, I just wanted to say that I asked MB to give that uh, kind of overview of, of the organization because they've done so much in our community over many years. And I wanted uh, uh, everyone to know a little bit about, about the background of their organization. So MB, if you want to go ahead and uh, talk about uh, each uh, organization, and, and uh, I think we have representatives from each here, correct? So before I go into it, I don't want to take uh, full credit uh, for the BAPS Charities work, but BAPS Charities asked, uh, reached out to me and Dr. Vasant and our local group of volunteer uh, to ask the, what are the needs in the local <clears throat> area right now, and if we can continue to help all the nonprofit who specially engaged into the COVID-19 uh, support work. And mayor has suggested six, seven uh, nonprofit in a town, but uh, we were able to get the three uh, nonprofit that been selected by the BAPS charities. One is the Greater <clears throat> Matthews uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Matthews Health Center and Matthews Free Medical Clinic. So I wanna appreciate uh, mayor's input and mayor's advice. Uh, so he's a fully engaged uh, mayor and we truly appreciate all the commissioner who has been supportive about all our walkathons in the past, our healthcare, health fair in the past, but uh, our heart still goes to a local nonprofit who tirelessly work during this COVID. And as we all know, the numbers are growing and this Mr. Rob just mentioned how the numbers are growing and majority of the people are getting directly or indirectly affected by this COVID-19 and new variant. So during this time, we want to support all the nonprofit we could. And we truly, thankful to be a PS charity as well, that they thinking about us also in this community. So again, once again, I appreciate all the nonprofit. I appreciate the mayor and the entire town of Matthew's staff that constantly supporting different causes and different way you all serve. Thank you, Andy. I wanna give uh, each, each of the nonprofits that received a gift an opportunity to speak for a moment. And I think we see uh, some familiar faces here. We have uh, Natisha Rivera-Patrick. Uh, would you like to speak first for the Habitat? Sure, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, and guests. Uh, we certainly are thankful for this new relationship we have with BAPS, and uh, we're pleasantly surprised to be told we were one of the charities that would be receiving a donation. And so MB had me bring the big check home. So ladies, if you have your big check with you, make sure you show that too. Um, certainly at a, a time, um, this gift was timely for us and I shared that with them earlier. So just wanted to say a huge uh, thank you to everyone that played a part in uh, putting our name out there and starting this new relationship for us and helping us continue to work our mission. Thanks guys. Okay, thank you. Go on to uh, Sandra Conway from the Youth Help Center. Sorry, right, trying to unmute, there I am. So we are equally grateful as well. I'm gonna show the big check right off the beginning. I don't think it'll fit in my view, but uh, uh, you know, we have given out um, over $1.2 million in about 18 months and we're able to serve about 8,000 of our local residents. And it's these types of um, donations and gifts that make up that big number. And we're just so grateful on behalf of our clients. We just are so appreciative. So thank you. All right, thank you. And last but not least, we have Amy Carr from the Matthews Free Medical Clinic. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. I just wanna say thank you so much to BAPS Charities. Um, I too have the, 
big check. I don't know how well you can see it. Um, we have seen over a 60% increase in new patients with the clinic over the last uh, two years since COVID. Um, I can't thank you enough, as you can imagine, and have already heard, it's not just um, the people that we're serving, but our staff has felt it firsthand, um, the shortages with this new variant. And um, we're always trying to promote the slow of the spread of COVID um, over the last two years, which then includes canceling fundraisers and um, in-person events and community events, sharing our mission. So we've been hit hard financially through that and yet have had a, a great demand put on us. So the fact that we can um, receive these funds is just <clears throat> such an honor and we're so gracious. So um, we're so grateful um, for your generosity. So thank you so much. And um, it's great to see everybody this evening. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, may I make a statement? Sure. Yeah. I wanted to say that uh, Dr. Patel and MB, if everybody in the, in the world lived their life according to your service statement, the world would be a much better place. And also, if everybody served the community like these three wonderful organizations, uh, if everyone had such an open heart and an open sense of giving and selflessness, uh, this world would be much, much better off. And thank you. Thank you for your contributions. And thank you, three organizations, for everything you do in town. You're here. Well said. So, again, thank you. Uh, as we spoke this afternoon, we're hopeful that we can do the walkathon this year, which uh, uh, elected folks uh, typically participate in if you just so desire. So, hopefully, uh, COVID will be in our rearview mirror, I hope, and uh, we can do that. So, Thank you. Uh, we appreciate everything you do so much. So have a good night. I'll move on to the, to, uh, the next agenda item. Uh, are there any items to be added to the agenda first, uh, Mr. Town Manager? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, you may now indicate your desire to make a public comment by using Zoom's raise hand feature. Or if you're on a desktop or mobile device, click raise hand in the webinar controls. You'll be recognized by the name listed in your Zoom window. If you've joined by telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand and you'll be recognized by your telephone number. Once you're called on, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you have one and state your name for the record. We'll have four minutes to speak. We do have, I believe, two two speakers that are pre-registered. Is that correct, Corey? Uh, yes, Mayor. We have Jennifer Delahara and Arthur Griffin, uh, and we will have those folks speak first. Ms. Delahara, if you can. Thank you. Um, Jay Camp will put the timer on so you can start speaking once the timer starts the countdown. Well, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and Matthew Town Commissioners. My name is Jennifer De La Hara, and the last I saw you was on December 13th on a chilly evening when you were all sworn in. Congratulations to you all. I wanted to take a brief moment to come before you, as I've been told I can, and the good people of Matthews to officially announce my candidacy for Mecklenburg County Commissioner at large. I am a former educator, a small business owner, a wife, a mother of two CMS students. And as you already know, I currently serve at large on the Board of Education. I plan to take the government experience I have gained with me to my hopeful new seat on the County Commission. And as I expand my role to address public health, including mental health, public parks and environmental stewardship, and yes, appropriate funding of our schools including ensuring that a successful school bond gets on the 2023 ballot. We need to build quality facilities that are not overcrowded, where our educators are proud to teach in and where our students deserve to learn in. I would invite the public to view my website at jenniferformech.com. That's jennifer, the number four, mech.com. And I thank you for this opportunity to speak for you, before you this evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Arthur Griffin. Mr. Griffin, if you can turn your camera on if you have one and you may begin speaking when the timer starts counting down. You'll have to unmute yourself too, sir.
Can you see me and hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Higdon and commissioners and Commissioner Whitley. My good friend, my name is Arthur Griffin, and I'm a candidate for an at-large seat on the Mecklenburg County Board of Commissioners. I want to thank you for allowing me an opportunity to introduce myself. For 17 years, I served this community as a member of the school board. Five of those years, I served as chair. My community service includes court appointed guardian at litem, big brother and big sister program here in Mecklenburg County, the Headshot Policy Council. I was a member of the Mecklenburg County Board of Social Services, one of the current responsibilities of the present County Commission, Board of Directors of the Charlotte Area Fund, a founder of Charlotte's chapter of the National Black Child Development Institute, on the Executive Council of Mecklenburg Boy Scouts, just to name a few of the many community organizations served. Currently, I serve as chair of the Student Success and Strategic Initiatives Committee of Central Piedmont Community College Board of Trustees. I also serve on an advisory council of the Legal Aid Society and School Leadership Council of the Renaissance West Community Mission. I'm a Vietnam veteran and retired at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. My corporate experience, I retired as a senior vice president at McGraw Hill Education in New York, where the year before retiring, I achieved 101% of a $670 million revenue target. So why am I running for an at-large seat on the Mecklenburg County Board of County Commission? As you have heard, my life has been one of service. Today, I see a real and present need for experienced leadership, and I wanna serve again. I wanna help my community achieve some of its quality of life goals. Laura Clark, the current CEO and president of the United Way of the Carolinas, said the Chetty study, a national study about upward mobility, found Charlotte to be dead last for upward mobility was nothing new that she didn't already know and that many others living here knew this fact prior to this study. She said, of our community efforts are not researched and informed and our ability to fund legacy programs often don't demonstrate desired outcomes. As a community, we can absolutely do better. These are challenging times and a time when ex experienced leadership is needed to improve real upward mobility opportunities, not only as a parent and grandparent, but as a trustee at Central Piedmont, I know and see firsthand how important a great education is to obtain a good job with living wages, how important family stability is with affordable housing. And speaking of housing, I spoke to all seven of the mayors in Mecklenburg County and affordable housing was a common theme, not just workforce housing, but housing for our seniors to age gracefully in place near their grandchildren and families and communities they have come to love. The County Commission also sits as a board of health. COVID clearly pointed to a need for access to great health care. I support increased access to greenways and parks and a strong, resilient local economy. You should know that approximately 75 cents of every dollar the county spends come from residents like you and me through real estate and sales tax revenue. I pledge to be a good steward of the funds entrusted to me. To learn more about me, you can visit my website at griffinformecklenburgcounty.com. I hope that I can earn your consideration and your vote. Thank you and good evening. All right, thank you. Um, it's gonna be a, a uh, interesting race there for for the uh, county commission. Uh, the election has been moved, I believe, till May. Um, so uh, appreciate our two speakers uh, um, informing us of their candidacy. Uh, Lori, has anybody else signed up to speak tonight? No, sir. Raise their hand. Okay, we'll move on to the next agenda item. I'll entertain a motion to recess the regular meeting for public hearings on applications to amend the unified development ordinance and land use map the town of Matthews. So moved. A motion from Mayor Pro Tem McCool. Do we have a second? I second. Commissioner Whitley, we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tafano? Mr. Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Garner? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. 
Commissioner Urban. Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. So we uh, now uh, we'll, we'll consider these motions. First, I'd like Jay to introduce the planning board members in attendance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm just going to read out our planning board uh, committee because I'm not sure who's here this evening. Uh, our chair is Mike Foster, Vice Chair Natasha Edwards, Jonathan Clayton, Tom Dorsey, Jim Johnson, Howie Labner, Sarah Walker, and Youth Voices Prayag Patel and Miranda Stujanke. Thank you. And as I do uh, every time this, when we have our, our uh, meetings with the planning board, I want to thank them for their for the dedication because it's a very time consuming board to, to uh, participate on. So the first one we'll look at is uh, 8A motion 21-4 to amend the text of the Unified Development Ordinance to put into compliance with the new decriminalization requirements of the General Assembly of North Carolina. And I believe Ms. Bennett's gonna walk us through this. Uh, yes, I am going to help you through that. Um, and it's gonna be really brief. Um, this is something much like um, 160D that you adopted a few months ago that we just have to do. Um, it's a result of a SB 300, which was a comprehensive criminal justice reform package, and it was adopted um, into law last year. And what it did was it required that local governments had to specifically identify criminally enforced violations, and then they had to amend their ordinances to reflect those that were no longer allowed. So from a planning and zoning standpoint, the law just prohibits criminal enforcement of land use regulations. And we have other enforcement options, just not criminal. And they're kind of, you can see here, um, they're scattered throughout uh, our unified development ordinance. Um, so most of it, anytime it refers to a, a criminal enforcement, it'll just be repealed, it'll be taken away. But there are still civil penalties. May I comment also? Go ahead, sir. The criminal penalties are still allowed under the section dealing with minimum housing. So the revised ordinance that I gave you tonight uh, puts in and remains in place criminal provisions for the minimum housing, but all the other criminal pro uh, provisions have been will be eliminated by this ordinance with all the other sections of the UDO. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Are there any questions from the Board of Commissioners or the Planning Board for Nadine or for Mr. Buckley? Okay, not seeing any. Lori, has anybody uh, from the public signed up in advance to speak on this? No, sir. All right, once again, uh, I'd like to explain for anyone in the Zoom audience that you can make comments now. Uh, if you want to comment on this item, use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you're on a desktop or mobile device, click raise hand in the webinar controls. You'll be recognized by the name listed in your room. If you've joined by telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll be recognized by your telephone number. Once, you're, once you've called in, once you're called on, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you have one, and state your name for the record. Uh, Lori, has uh, anybody taken us up no. on this opportunity? No, sir. All right, this application will be heard by the planning board on January 25th, 2022, and come back to this board on February 14th, 2022. I will now entertain a motion to reconvene our regular meeting. So moved. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McCool, second by Commissioner Whitley. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tofano? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Commissioner Garner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Urban? Yes. I vote yes as well. We're now reconvened. And I go on to agenda item number 10, planning and development business. Uh, there was no planning board meeting last month, so we don't have a planning board report. Uh, so we'll go on to item A, consider site plan and elevations for the Matthews Commerce, Commerce Center at 10800 Monroe Road. Darren Hallman. Thank you, Mayor. Give me one second. All right, so this is a property over in Matthews Commerce Center. It is zoned I1CD. Um, this is on Monroe Road. It's back in behind uh, Dennis Salud and Point Blank Range. 
it butts up against uh, Warner Park. Uh, this site is conditionally zoned as part of those conditional zone or the conditional zoning that was put in place in uh, 2010. Uh, there were notes that the site plan and the building elevations all had to come back before the Board of Commissioners before final approval or the issuance of building permits. Uh, last month, uh, December 13th meeting, the Board of Commissioners did approve the site plan. Um, however, they de you delayed the uh, approval of the building elevations until this month so they can be reworked. Uh, there was a note that the screening on the roof mounted mechanical equipment, um, or that the mechanical equipment on the roof should be screened. And then uh, there was some recessed decorative brick padding pattern added to the front and side, or the two front facades. Uh, this is the left side elevation. This is the one that would be uh, butting up against the, or fronting the private street in the development uh, that dead ends into Warner Park. This is the parking lot side elevation. Uh, these are the recessed decorative brick paddings that were added. Uh, I believe they also went back and added a few light fixtures. Then it's a little hard to make out on the, um, the colored renderings. Um, however, these squares are recessed a little bit. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Yes, uh, Commissioner Garner. I do have one question about, and this wasn't on those drawings, but um, they sent over the planting uh, plans for us and they had an Ellie Agnes on there. Um, I wanna make sure that was changed to something that's on the approved plant list. Right, so um, for the landscaping plan, we can, or uh, for the planning schedule, that's something that we correct, can correct during site plan review. So right now they're in the first cycle, uh, of site plan review for, uh, since the site plan was approved last month. Uh, so that's a comment that we can make and address on that. Great, thank you. And other than that, I appreciate all the work they've done to, uh, to satisfy both mine and Commissioner Urban's um, input. Commissioner Tofano, did you have a question, sir? I was just wondering if you had happened to have a photograph or a rendering of what the existing buildings are in that area handy. If not, it appears that mm -hmm. it, it appears that they're the same structure and basic design. Is that would that be a correct assumption? Um, it's a similar or the base building is similar to Red Radish and I believe there's a building uh, behind Dennis Salute. I can't remember off the top of my head uh, what business is in there. Um, but that building, it's a similar design to it. There are some slight differences between the three, though. Like, I believe the Red Radish building, it has uh, some metal awnings that cover the side of it on the street side and the parking lot side. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that there was a continuity there. It appears that there is. Thank you. Hey, John. Yeah. Mr. Urban, um, I, I, without any further questions, I have no problem. Uh, I do thank the petitioner for making these adjustments. I thank for Renee for looking at it. Um, I go ahead and motion that we approve the proposed elevations. Thank you. We have a motion for Commissioner Urban. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Garner. Any further discussion? We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tofano. Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Commissioner Garner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. I vote yes as well, and I want to echo the comments of others. We're really thankful for the applicant to go back and make those uh, requested changes. I think we've got a, a better building because of it, so thank you.
All right, we'll move on to uh, item two, consider elevations for two capital partners, Independence Boulevard, over Cash Drive, Northeast Parkway development area. Jay Camp. All right, so bear with me. I've got a few exhibits I uh, wanna share with you all. And I know the applicant is here uh, this evening and they've got a presentation on their updated drawings. So just briefly, I'll, uh, for recap, uh, this is the memo we've put together that sort of describes how we got here. Um, we had multiple development areas, development area A and B. Last month, uh, commissioners did approve the elevations for the townhome structures and the single family structures on the site deferred approval of the um, elevation to, for the apartments uh, to a later date, which is this evening. We have received new renderings. And while Darren was uh, doing his presentation, I, I recalled what I meant to do earlier today and I was caught up working on my presentation and I wanted to do a side-by-side -side for you all. So um, the lower image is what was part of the approved zoning package for two capital. The above image is the revised rendering. So you, you can see they've come back with a, a 3D perspective here that is taken from a, a similar angle as the original. Um, the roof lines have obviously changed. It's no longer a pitched roof. Um, so some of the brickwork is more similar. Um, and I'll let Mr. Taubel talk more about the uh, the architectural elevations. But I just want to create this. And, and I can I can go back to this if anybody wants to study it further. But uh, just wanted to put something together so you could see side by side uh, uh, the similarities and the differences with the original um, approved drawings. Yeah. Quick, quick question when I saw that. Is the park space smaller in the one photo or is that just a perspective? That's a good question. I think it's the perspective looking at the, the approved plans. You know, part of that is NCDOT property and, and they have been I need to double check. I think they've been successful in getting that taken care of, but I would need to uh, uh, check with uh, Susan and um, I think Rob's working on the plan review on that one. It's the okay. perspective, Ken. Look, look yeah. at the position of the building and the street edges. You can see they move the camera on the rendering. Oh, I do, yeah. I do see that now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. see the sign is real far away and they're standing on the sign in the second image. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions for Jay before we go on to uh, allow Mr. Tallville to talk? Uh, Commissioner Garner? I just have a quick question. I don't remember, but when are we looking at the clubhouse again? Uh, I need to go back and look at the motion. That, that may have been part of the motion last month. Okay. I didn't know if we were going to get an update on that doorway. I know that he agreed to do um, something similar to the back, but. That okay. is, I think that's part of development area B. So I, I think there was some, if I recall from the meeting, I know it's only been a month ago. I think there was reference to maybe doing some further tweaks to it, but I, I don't recall that the clubhouse is coming back, but I'll, Wes, do you recall what, how you left that? Yeah, I think you all approved it subject to making yeah. that front elevation near the rear elevation. Um, okay. Renee, I can show you on the rendering, the updated rendering, you, we can zoom in and you can sort of see that we mirrored that, but I'm happy to you know, email it back around to everybody just to, for, you know, confirmation purposes. But I, I believe that what y'all did was just approve it subject to the front elevation being similar to the rear one. Okay. Thank you. I couldn't remember if that was part of this or no part problem. of what we approved. So thanks. Wes, do you want me to screen share or do you have something you want to Yeah, present? I think she, if you could just... Uh, pull up our presentation. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, th guys, I appreciate everybody's time again. I think, you know, um, we're making good progress. Uh, it's a complicated deal, but um, so we've got some updated elevations that Jay sort of hit on. This is for air development area A, which is the two buildings that sit out in the corner of Overcash and Northeast Parkway. Um, to Commissioner McCool's question, the park hadn't changed in size. That was just the sort of uh, perspectives. And Jay, you're correct. There's been a flurry of uh, coordination between uh, the town engineer and Rob and, and NCDOT about the right-of-way swap and whether it's a right-of-way swap or an easement and what legal people have to be involved. But everybody, at least at this point, the NCDOT 
uh, is continuing to play nice in the sandbox and, and, you know, recognizes they don't need this land and we're giving them some, and this is for a public park. And so everything is moving through its process during the site development approvals. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so Renee, if you can see, if you can see the center there, that's the front elevation of the clubhouse in the rear. Uh, and you can see we sort of created that mirror, but I'll, I'll be happy to, you know, Jay offline email everybody um, just so everybody can see it. But so this is the updated front buildings. As you can, as Jay mentioned, you can see we tried to revert back, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to closer to the to the original design intent. So, um, you know, taking advantage of the bigger windows, um, trying to create more of a mill feel. Uh, obviously, as we got into further unit refinement, and locations of windows and balconies and egress requirements and getting the, the building situated on the site and sorting through uh, grading and the existing typo of the DOT roads and the future plans and trying to tie all those different things in it, pushed and pulled some things in some different, different um, directions as one can imagine. But I think the design intent is still there. Um, Jay, maybe just keep, keep pushing through some of these plans. Um, there's a couple of color schemes, you know, I, just in the interest of, of, I don't know how much y'all know this, but up Mecklenburg counties, uh, you know, we're in their building permit review queue and we need to get these plans approved before we do it. And so we've got a slot in February. So I kind of put a couple of just color perspectives together in case one st struck a chord, whether, you know, good or bad with the town. My preference actually, Jay, if you don't mind going back up a second. Um, the, you can sort of see this one right here. If you can see sort of those lighter tone elements in the center, uh, that's my preference. But I think if, if you know if if the council's got a strong preference, if you scroll to the top one, you can see those those elements are are got a darker tone in here. I, I kind of prefer the lighter one. I think it breaks the massing up a little bit more. Um, but just wanted to highlight that there. Are, we did that on purpose so we can sort of show you. Uh, two schemes in case, you know, the, 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 you know, the board and council preferred, you know, significantly one over the other, or if there's, there's not some preference one way or the other, we can continue to move forward. But uh, so these are just sort of, you know, again, 3D renderings and we can go back to the, to the plan elevations, Jay. Um, you know, similar, we, we, we've been working as we've got into construction drawings now, uh, we've been working with the various window manufacturers. I don't know if y'all know this, but one of the peculiarities of COVID is you can't get windows. <laughs> so, and every window manufacturer has slightly different window standard sizes. And so, you know, it's been a little bit of a back and forth, but we've gotten, a, a, directed the design team to go back to larger windows, which was always the intent. Um, and you can start to see some of this. So if you keep, keep scrolling through, Jay, these are just the elevations, you know, front, back, and side. Um, again, wrapping them all the way around the building, trying to create continuity. I, I just elevated the black one, but you can imagine where some of the whites, you know, would, 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 would break up. The massing a little bit and then i think jay the last couple showed some window comparisons renee i think you and some others had sort of mentioned um again just more perspectives as you sort of maneuver around the buildings these are you know mirror buildings um here's just some some of the that that uh cementitious uh, board and batten siding and application so you can see the darks and the lights and how it can work well with the bricks uh and some of the color paletting that we're going to utilize and then jay i think the last two is what i want to sort of show um I think some people before had asked about the window sizes and so some of this again is perspective you know and zoomed in versus zoomed out but I actually had to measure them uh one of the beauties of how they build these things in BIM now is they can actually get in there and measure everything fairly succinctly so you can sort of see everyone's a little bit different obviously as we drop units in and locations of bathrooms versus closets and bedrooms and everything uh maneuvered around the site things pushed around a little bit but nominally you can see I think we've sort of met the, the, the sort of similar design intent of big expansive windows um, you know, trying to create that mill intent and that mill mill design. Um, and that, yeah, we're, we're really pleased with where they are, but, but certainly welcome any comments or feedback. All right, thank you, Wes. Are there any uh, comments, uh, Commissioner Garner? Um, Wes, the, I think these look a lot closer to what we started off with and I appreciate that work. And I, I do think that the difference in just having the lighting in the elevation so you, that were similar to the first drawings uh, made it clear that the windows weren't that much different. So thank you for all your work on this. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Tufano. Yes. Uh, hi, Wes. My name is Mark Tufano. Uh, could you bring up the site plan, please, Jay? There you go. Um, I was visiting the property and I was having trouble orienting myself on this site plan to where the existing commercial property is there. Can you help me? 
Uh, yeah, Jay, if you've got the cursor, you want to point to the other yeah, guy. That's what I thought. Uh, so currently, right now, there's an, a, a single home out there all by itself on a private drive. Where is that with that respect? That's property immediately to the north of us on Overcash. Um, so they actually, they're, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things we discovered during our diligence is their driveway was actually located on our property. So we worked with them prior to closing uh, to get their driveway relocated. Well, that that's was my question because it's a private drive, so uh, that's all been taken care of, right? Yep, correct. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so, where you had the cursors, that's where the back of the uh, sporting goods store is, and all of that. Correct. It sets back. It sets back further. It's probably almost exactly where Jay's mouse is. I think exactly. Jay exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I, that's what I thought, and I just wanted to make absolutely certain. No problem. Thank you. It's nice right. to meet you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or motions? Mr. Urban. The lighter color scheme, please. I, I agree. That'd be my yeah, point. I agree with that too, John. Would anyone care to make a motion? All right. All right. Yeah. Make the dead guy say something here. <laughs> um, recommend approve submitted building elevations to development area A as per the conditions of rezoning 2027-22. Second. Motion by the nearly dead Commissioner Urban. Second by Mayor Pro Tem McCool. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tafano. Yes. Commissioner Whitley. Blessings on you, John. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Hoover. Yes. Commissioner Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCool. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. And uh, Wes, yeah, again, thank you for going back and making those adjustments. I think it's uh, it looks really nice now. So uh, we you. appreciate y'all's time and effort. Thank y'all. All you. right, we'll move on to item three: discuss micro mobility ordinance. Uh, Nadine Bennett. Um, before we get into the actual ordinance, I thought it would be a good idea to give you a refresher and for the new commissioners just to let you know why we are here, even talking about micromobility and an ordinance about it. So um, in case you don't know, micromobility is the kind of, it's small human or electric powered and it's shared. Um, and so e-scooters are considered micromobility, also the, the shared bikes that you used to see a lot. Um, uh, E-scooters got really popular in 2019. They were they just kind of exploded onto the scene. Not always in a good way, but they exploded onto the scene. The number of rides dipped in 2020. I can't imagine why. Um, then they they kind of started coming back in 2021, and they're probably coming back even more now. Um, Bird is an e-mobility provider, and they approached the town almost a year ago to talk about coming to Matthews. And they did that as part of their program to expand into smaller markets. So some of the benefits of um, e-scooters are they reduce greenhouse gas emissions because they're electric powered. Um, additional transportation options. Uh, they have the potential to expand the reach of public transportation in that they add what they call the first and last mile connections so people who have probably too long a walk to get to the bus can take micro mobility. Um, once they get to their destination, if their job is maybe a little bit of a walk, they would instead take something like an e-scooter. And probably the one that we most see is that they're kind of fun. Uh, I know a lot of people have concerns about uh, safety and crashes. And just like any other kind of transportation mode, there are, uh, there are accidents with e-scooters, um, the, some of the factors are roadway conditions, uh, alcohol, speed, and inexperience. But last time we talked about this, um, our bird representative mentioned that they do have a beginner mode and it, it makes it so that um, it will kind of slowly start you out so that you're not just racing along immediately. One way that you can deal with safety issues is to educate people about how to use scooters and where to use them. Um, some things you might want to know, BIRD locates a local partner and a fleet manager. So this isn't something that the town would be operating. 
we'd be a contact person, but uh, we wouldn't actually be out there with the scooters. Uh, they generally do 50 units to start. Uh, it's a trial period that we start with, so we can end it with a 30 day notice to terminate. Um, I think it would probably make sense if we have an agreement and there's nothing saying we're gonna to have to have an agreement at this point, but if we do, probably wanna get in place by the spring since spring and summer are just the, the biggest times for using scooters and that's when we and they would know whether they're gonna be used here. Uh, one thing that BIRD provides is a data dashboard where they, they show you where the scooters are being used. They show um, how many rides there have been um, and you can see the heat map there, but this is, this is a real one from um, the city of Gastonia. Gastonia started their program with e-scooters a year ago. Uh, and I've been talking to the assistant town manager there, um, Quentin McFatter, and this is the report that they did for them, I think three quarters of the way through the year. This would have been after the summer, showing the number of rides and where they'd been. Um, Gastonia had it specifically. They were interested specifically in bringing people to their new stadium downtown. They have this beautiful new little stadium, but they um, don't have really good parking around it. So they were using scooters to get people there. And according to Quentin, he didn't have a bad thing to say about having scooters in Gastonia. Um, he says it, it's worked really well. Um, he doesn't have to be involved with it that much. Um, he did admit, because I asked him about enforcement, you know, how do you enforce the things that are in the, um, the agreement and the ordinance? And he said, he really feels like the, um, maybe the police have bigger things on their minds. Um, and he said that they, they don't actually do that much, but I guess that also means that they're not called on very much either. So the program, as he sees it, has been very successful in Gastonia. So the ordinance that you have, and again, we're not voting on this tonight, but the ordinance that you have, I based it on the Winston-Salem one and Kinston, which I think are pretty much the same model ordinance. And the ordinance addresses things like prohibited conduct, um, the procedure for getting a permit, obligations of the permit holders. Um, they've got to have a 24 seven hotline and they do actually have to have a local office. And that was questioned by a few people who read through the ordinance. So I asked Quentin and Gastonia, do they actually have a local storefront? He said they do. Um, it's got insurance requirements, uh, limitations on town liability, which I think is very important and customer requirements. And the ordinance as it is right now, it's gone through a couple of reviews um, and there are some minor changes that people have suggested, and there will probably continue to be some minor changes, so I will be updating on that. Um, I've been in touch with the police department and they're right now working out uh, their procedures and protocols for how they're going to address this if it becomes, if we actually have scooters on the street. And they're going to be in touch with Gastonia as well to see how they're doing it. So one of the, one of the good things about these scooters is uh, they can geofence them. And that means they can determine exact areas where they can go. Um, Gastonia, as they have their focus, they're focused on the downtown. Uh, this is something that we came up with uh, with our transportation planner. Uh, so the area in yellow, that would be the trial area. Um, we have been back and forth on whether we want to allow them on Trade Street. Right now, we think we wouldn't because of potential um, scooter and pedestrian conflict. Um, but again, we're still talking about that. And with the geofencing, it wouldn't be a matter of enforcement because they wouldn't even be allowed onto, um, onto those two blocks. I think, I think that's my last slide. Yes, that's it. So again- Nadine, just a point of clarification. You said not allowed on Trade Street. Do you mean North Trade Street or all North and South? Two blocks, two blocks of Trade Street there. North Trade, okay. So North there's John Street. Street right there and that's East Matthews right there. So really right in the downtown. One thing that I didn't mention though, is that most communities prohibit use on the sidewalks and, and that's actually in the ordinance. Um, talking it over back and forth a lot um, with Dana, the transportation planner and a few other people, we actually want to allow them on the sidewalks. We feel like they'd be safer on the sidewalks than they would on the roads right now. Um, and the place where that would probably be the biggest problem to have them on the sidewalks would be on Trade Street, and that's why we want to prohibit that entire area. And again, 
just adopting the ordinance doesn't mean that you would immediately see scooters on the street. You would still have to go through a process with Bird to approve a permit and really work out some of these details about where they'll go. And it's also just a trial period. Um, I presented this to the, the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, and they were all for it. They were excited about this idea. Um, I presented to the planning board, I think in November, and they had more concerns about it. Um, just concerns about safety and is this something we really need in Matthews? But I think they also, they said they really appreciated that it would only be a trial and that adopting the ordinance itself just prepares us to go into working out a permit. And if it, if it goes wrong, then we just, you know, we make them leave. It's not something we're required to have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McCool, you have a question? Yeah, I guess my question comes to the blocking off Trade Street. T to me, that would be kind of the hub of where people would want to get to and get out of, you know, people, you know, going in downtown for an evening or, or whatnot. And so I guess my confusion is, is why would we block off one of the main hubs where people and the population would be going? We would have them, we would block them from literally being right on Trade Street and on those sidewalks, but they could go to a, um, any parking that's in the nearby area. It'd just be like somebody who had to park like a block over and then you walk over onto Trade, trade Street. Would, so one of the things we do have to work out too is where we would encourage parking. But really that just keeps them right off the street and the sidewalk right there in that main drag, where as you say, that's where people go. So that's the, the biggest possibility for conflict. So they would have to be directed like on one They of the would side. have to be directed, yes, to a parking spot. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Tufano. Yes, I have a statement first and then a uh, question. Uh, having worked in Uptown Charlotte for many years and having hundreds of scooters down there, under no circumstances should they be allowed on the sidewalk. Uh, it is an extraordinarily dangerous situation. They run at high speeds uh, and they literally take control of the sidewalks. In a situation on, in uh, pedestrian traffic as we have on Trade Street, to permit them on the sidewalk would be a, a really misjudgment. Uh, now, having said that, it's uh, also a great boon, I think, to have this in our town. And I think we need to uh, make every consideration that we can in order to get them in. I think the young people love them and it's a great way to get from point A to point B quickly. Uh, but I have a question. I've read the ordinance itself uh, quite a number of times. Uh, I'm glad the first question I had was what, where was it based? And, and you answered that it was based on the Winston-Salem and, and Kinston uh, ordinance. Is that correct, Nadine? That's correct, yes. Okay, and then my second one, since Charlie uh, has a signature down at the bottom, our town attorney, uh, it appears uh, this is directed toward uh, uh, our town attorney, Charles Buckley. It appears that there's an, an inordinate amount of power given to the town manager in this ordinance. Uh, they literally have the ability to revoke licenses to uh, provide the license almost unilaterally. There is a case where they uh, set up a committee and a staff, but what, he, what troubles me even more is that the appeal process uh, for the company actually goes back through the town manager and the town manager unilaterally can have the option of uh, denying the appeal. Uh, there's, there's no checks and balances in this, it's a very, town manager oriented, very town manager powerful. And that opens up all kinds of possibilities of misuse in my opinion. So Charlie, can you help me uh, uh, maybe mitigate my concerns? Well, you're, you're right. It is manager oriented in terms of its um, functionality in, um, for, as a municipality, its functionality. Uh, but there are also cases out there that say that it's okay. and one of the areas that this is okay is like in the personnel issues where the town manager may make a decision, uh, but he's also the appellate uh, hearing officer as well. And so that does not in and of itself present a problem from a legal standpoint uh, 
and the, somewhere over the, the, the town board would have some oversight of this operation as well through the town manager. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Your, your uh, review of that is absolutely correct. And I can say that we actually consider um, where to put it, where to put that power, I guess. Um, we considered putting it in the planning department, but it was kind of beyond, probably beyond our expertise in a lot of ways. So the way that we saw it was that the town manager or his or her designee um, and a committee. So the way we picture it is that it would be the town manager probably with input from the planning department, also with input from our transportation planner. So we did not see it that way, which is not to say that that's not the way it's written, the way you're. Yeah, well, it's, it's not written that way, Nadine. It's really quite clear that the town manager has literally ultimate authority over this entire operation. Uh, the fact that there's an appeal process that comes back through the town manager and, and he has unilateral authority to deny the appeal without any further recourse uh, to the petitioner, uh, uh, I find very troubling. So uh, in its current state with so much centric power and the town manager without any oversight, I, I, find, that, I find that very troubling. Okay, are there other comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner Hoover. Uh, yes, um, I think these, there are a lot of fun, I've been on them, but I'm very concerned about the safety, um, just riding, riding on these things around in, in Matthews. And I agree with Commissioner Tafana, they cannot be on sidewalks. Um, and I was glad to see uh, that Trey Street would be blocked off because if Trade Street is just really a congested area. And if you had someone on a the sidewalk, then someone walking out of Renfro Hardware, we might have a problem there. Um, yeah, I just think we may need a little bit more uh, info and input on this. I, I'm just really concerned with people riding around on the street on these, on these uh, scooters. Um, it's, it, it's just really questionable for me with, with the safety. Just not sure about that. And I can continue to talk to Dennis to Janky, our transportation planner, about the idea of them being on the sidewalks too. Again, that's something that we talked a lot about. We can just we can further discuss it. And yeah, I, but see them on the streets and and car. I mean, just regular little regular little motorcycle kind of scooters. Those are dangerous enough as it is too. I mean, I know we have one and it's scary being on those little kind of scooters and then to be on these little things you stand up on. Um, I'm just really concerned about the safety of uh, the, the people that the, the young, the young people that use these or I mean, anyone who uses them. It, it, it's just really uh, thin line where we're crossing with the safety here. Yeah, I'd like to say that I can confirm uh, Commissioner Tofano's uh, comment because I've been downtown Charlotte on a few occasions and nearly been run over by scooters just going wild. I mean, they, I don't know what the speed limits are there, but it seems like they're going 25 or 30 miles an hour on the sidewalk. And I think seen... you can you can limit their um, bird can actually limit their speeds. Yeah. Um, they can slow them down in certain areas of town. Um, and I think I can't remember what was in the ordinance it might be 20, but they could lower that to 15. They can, they can definitely control their maximum speeds. Yeah, in, in Charlotte, they tend to bob and weave on the sidewalks in between oh, yes. pedestrians. And I've seen, you know, several people, several near misses, and I've heard of, of, you know, actual wrecks that were pretty significant. Uh, Commissioner Garner, you had a comment? You know, well, I think uh, there are currently people who must live in proximity of downtown, if not in downtown, that ride these scooters around. Uh, and so there are laws about, you know, about wearing helmets and, and safety enforcement. Um, I think that this is an important aspect of that last mile transportation, especially as we get towards having planning for the silver line. Um, I think this is filling in gaps of transportation that we currently don't cover in Matthews. It encourages, uh, it, it could encourage movement from downtown out to like the sportsplex. So I think, you know, it's not um, any sort of change in technology is 
a little bit intimidating, but I think there are enough um, measures in place that we can come up with a micromobility uh, ordinance that will keep both pedestrians and scooter riders safe. So to be clear, uh, Commissioner Garner, you're suggesting that you would like to see them allowed in the downtown area? I fully support it. I, we, we already have a handful of people who own uh, electric scooters and ride them around downtown. I haven't seen any issues with that. And it seems to be um, gaining in popularity. I think it will only gain in popularity and uh, could be, you know, a draw, frankly. Yeah, a, uh, a frequent comment that I've heard from just constituents is if you can't take them downtown, where are you going to take, where are you going to ride them? You know, that's where all of our stuff is, the restaurants and places in bus stop and where you want to go is downtown. If we forbid that, uh, I guess, you know, possibly on the Greenway or whatever, but it, it really uh, limits the appeal. Uh, and, and again, sorry, I was going to just add that um, we're not keeping them out of the entire downtown. It's really just a sidewalk and the street right there. And they can park right outside of there and then just you know walk a few feet to a restaurant or to whatever. So we're not just prohibiting it in a broad area downtown. Understood, thank you for that clarification. Commissioner Tafano. Yes, uh, no, I agree with uh, uh, Renee that it's really uh, needed and especially as we progress more toward uh, trying to get some commuter in here and uh, trains in town. Uh, but to mitigate your concerns, Gina, uh, for being on the sidewalks, absolutely not under any circumstances. But for some reason, when they're on the road, uh, all the young people seem to take care of themselves pretty well. And uh, I think it would be uh, beneficial in, in the long run to have that kind of traffic on, on Trade Street, but definitely not on the sidewalks. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McCool, do you have a comment? Yeah, just two two quick ones. Uh, one is the resident person from the generation who uses these <laughs> the most, um, and, and more people from my generation are moving here. These are really, really crucial to have to kind of build our community as we grow. And also the pieces that makes it a little bit more affordable to live here. You know, folks who are living in the new apartments that have been built, um, uh, I'm losing the name of them, but uh, across, behind Target, you know, they could be able to ride into town or ride to, to their work and it make it significantly more affordable without having to take a car, which also takes <laughs> cars off the road. So uh, definitely want to want to keep advocating for this. Nadine, have they uh, published a expected cost to use these? You mean to actually to rent them? Yes. Um, I mean, it's on their website. I'm not sure what it is, but they do also have, and I can't remember exactly what the details are, but they do have a program for lower income people. Um, and I can get you the details on that. I was but just it, curious to see how, you know, economically desirable it truly is. Or, or I, I know in some towns they're actually fairly expensive to, to, to rent a scooter. Uh, I can Commissioner, get that for you. Commissioner Hoover. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know, can we get uh, the stats from the city of Charlotte of accidents from from what they've had? I can check on that. I can try and find that. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect Charlotte has an order of magnitude more, yeah. more scooters. <laughs> they have a ton of them, so they have to keep that in mind as well. But uh, I, I really do think they have maybe a speed control problem because they're going just really, really fast there in Charlotte. Um, True. Yeah, true, true. Uh, but I'm just, just to kind of see, you know, I'm, just to get an idea of, of, of how, you know. Yeah, I try sure. to get that for you. Mr. Hoover, I, I share some of your concerns, but I'm willing to try this on it since we can terminate it. If it's a disaster, we can terminate the contract. Um, my concern also, I, I, I remember when Bird came, they talked about the fleet manager and keeping track of them and things like that. Also in Charlotte, at least when they first uh, introduced them, you know, you'd find them laying in creeks and in the middle of the road mm -hmm. and people would just, you know, throw them wherever people were stealing them. And it was just, it was a kind of a mess, kind of, looked were, kind of sloppy. They were unregulated when they first put that back in 2019, when they first dropped in, they were unregulated because okay. the companies dropped them before they, I mean, they did it before they asked You're permission. Right. 
I remember reading um, about and that. And then got in a lot of trouble. They pulled them all and then people started coming, communities came back with ordinances to regulate them. So that's why that happened then. Okay. Yeah. yeah they ended yeah. up in people's yards, you know, people yeah. just ditch them in somebody's yard. Oh, I still see them like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot less of it though, I think now than there yeah. was. Yeah. I, I just, think- it, it was just speed for me with the safety aspect. I don't want to get it. And then I don't know who knows how much longer. And then you read in the paper, oh, we've got a, someone who's been hit by a car and now deceased from it. That I'm just, the safety is just my, I'm thinking of the town of Matthews and where they can really ride it. And yeah, I think they're a cool idea, but it's just that safety aspect has just really got me concerned about it. Commissioner Tufano. Yes, a procedural question. In the agenda, it says discuss the uh, mobility uh, ordinance. Uh, I'm hearing uh, in a discussion that there might be a vote on that or an adoption of that this evening. No, it's not. This evening. Okay. That's not the intent this evening. It was really just to to discuss it and then it'll come back to you after we've discussed it behind the scenes a bit more and possibly made some changes. We'll bring it back. Okay, well, in that case, I'd like to make a statement that I would not be able to vote for this in its current form because of the extraordinary focus on the power of the town manager. So if that could be, if that could be um, uh, reviewed and perhaps modified, I'd like to, to uh, suggest that. We can review that. I ask uh, Mr. Buckley a question, is, is the verbiage uh, in the current proposed ordinance similar to other ordinances with regards to the uh, power given to the town manager to terminate, et cetera? Well, that, I, that I have not done a study of other ordinances. I, I relied on uh, Nadine's uh, research there in dealing with Winston-Salem and Kinston. I have not looked at any other ordinance. And no, I can I, say that they don't all have that much they don't have all that much detail in a lot of the other ordinances, and we thought it would be would be better to have that detail in the ordinance so that we now have my, the rules my, laid out right there. Let me restate my question. I wasn't talking about other towns. In okay. Matthews, is it common to for the town manager to be given this this sort of authority? Is it in other? And I don't know if there's anything that's close, but in the person in the personnel policy. The, the the town manager is uh, the ultimate decision maker, and all appeals go to him. Okay. Right, but this is a this is a civil penalty matter, and also a contractual matter. Correct, Commissioner Urban. I, I just um, I'm trying to get this out without losing my voice. We are a manager based centric town so hazen or the town manager has more authority than anybody else has and i don't have a a problem with that we as a board as a municipality have set up our statutes to indoctrinate that so i'm not sure if we're picking on the scooters why couldn't we pick on other things about town manager centric um the buck stops with the board members and should the town manager go rogue, that's where we have the authority to stop it. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that, that there, I hear so many other more critical concerns of safety and speed and location that I'm worried about the town manager going rogue over scooters. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just, it, it's, to me, it's not a, a conversation for this, unless the conversation is broader that somehow the town manager is just too much power centric and we have to rethink the charter as we stand as the, as the town. Take the hand down. All right. So uh, I think Nadine, we've, you've had some requests for some additional information regarding safety. I think that's a good idea. Uh, Commissioner Hoover to get that uh, data. Um, maybe from Gastonia uh, as well, which is a little bit smaller community or if there's a community more the size of uh, Matthews. I think Gastonia is significantly larger than Matthews as well. But uh, It's about 70,000. Yeah. But that might be a, a closer apples to apples comparison. Um, but 
for me personally, I can say I could, uh, I'd, I'd be willing to, uh, to green light this uh, because it is on a trial basis and we can just see how it works out. Uh, and addressing some of the, some of the concerns that were brought up tonight. Are there, are there any other comments or questions for Nadine regarding this topic tonight? The only thing I'd say is, or Nadine, what I'd suggest is on the enforcement side, see what other communities have done and see how they handle the process going to the board or going to the manager. You know, it's always healthy to give the board options and they can vote on their options. Okay, I will do that. All right, seeing as there's no more comments, we'll move on to the next uh, agenda item, the consent agenda. And thank you, Nadine, for that uh, information. I would entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda items 11A through I-6. I'll make that motion, Mayor. I'll second it. A motion from Commissioner Whitley, a second from Commissioner Garner. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tafano. You need to unmute, sir. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Mr. Garner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. We'll move on to new business item 12 Re review design build process for Fire Station 3. Uh, Chief Kinnenberg. Uh, well, good evening. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Um, uh, I'm going to try to drive and change screens, but and I'm I'm sorry that Commissioner Urban's not feeling well. Uh, I'm going to uh, hope that you would allow him to join in as we go through the presentation because he is the subject matter expert on this panel. Um, you uh, got the memo in your package, and I can't see any of you right now, so. Um, this is going to be interesting. Um, so, so this is this is background as we move forward on fire station number three. Uh, the intent is to uh, chief. Chief, we can't see the memo. If your intention is to share the memo, we we cannot see it. It right. did not come up. Okay, hold on. Let me hit the button again. Thank you, Hazen. I thought it was just me. I was frantically pushing buttons here. So, can can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, um, so, but before council votes ultimately to build Fire Station Three, we have to do some background work. Uh, in September of twenty one, uh, we published a request for qualifications for design construction management. Uh, and construction for a new fire station. Uh, our scope was intentionally broad. Um, the town has not built a building in over 20 years. Um, and the construction of municipal facilities has changed somewhat. Uh, we issued that uh, RFQ and we got back 10 proposals and five of them were classified as design, bid, build which is the traditional government municipal delivery method. And five are design build alternative delivery method proposals. Um, as we reviewed the uh, 10 proposals, um, Becky, Susan, two captains from the fire department and I reviewed these proposals. Uh, it became clear we were not reviewing apples and apples, but apples and oranges. Uh, our scope was a little too broad. We failed to identify, we were following an older RFQ requirement that we didn't mention prices, but we failed to mention an anticipated budget. Uh, state law changed in 2014 regarding specifically qualifications and specifically design bid pro build projects that we were just not aware of. Um, again, you got a fire chief, an engineer, a town assistant town manager, and some fire captains. Um, we found it important that we come back to you at this point and tell you where we are, give you some information on the uh, three different types of delivery and the two that we got back. Um, and I, if you took a look at the, the presentation I 
submitted. Uh, it's a little long. We'll look back at some of that in just a second. Um, so in, in, in design, bid, build, um, you get proposals back from architects who identify the engineering firms that will work with them in a design. It is the traditional approach. The, the end product of the design phase of a design bid build process is a set of permit ready plans that a contractor can issue a quote or a bid to build that station. Uh, the architect in the end would work for the town or for the owner uh, to provide construction oversight and administration of construction documents. In design build proposals, they're typically submitted by construction companies who identify an architect and engineering firms to be part of their team. The process is more of a blended approach. The process results in a completed project. Construction could commence before all of the design work is complete. Um, a third party firm would typically provide what the state refers to as bridging documents, equivalent to 35% of the completed design documentation for the project and provide construction oversight and administration on the part of the owner. Uh, design build is the preferred way to build fire stations in today's environment. It's considered to be more effective delivery method for uncomplicated product uh, projects. While a fire station is complex, it's not necessarily complicated, but it is complex. Um, where the scope of the project is well defined ahead of time, um, and the design build contractor teams collaborate with the owner, the designer, and the firm. Cost overruns due to change orders are typically minimized through the alternative design phase because the end product is a collaborative work in progress. Uh, a third delivery method known as construction manager at risk. You also select a qualified design firm and the contractor is hired at a midpoint uh, who provides a competitive bid. Nobody, none of our respondents provided a construction manager at risk proposal. Um, whether whoever's overseeing the construction, whether it's the architect in a design bid build, or it's a third party in construction manager at risk or design build, someone has to represent us because we do not have the internal expertise to manage and oversee administration of the project. So there's gonna be some fees paid to a third party or to an architect or to the commission company, depends on, depending on which uh, method you choose. Um, after talking to uh, several industry experts, staff recommends a design build delivery method for this project. The majority of RFQ respondents have experience with design build, so we're confident that when we reissue our RFQ uh, for a specific delivery method, we will have an ample number of firms to choose from. And in the end, uh, this, this phase costs nothing. Uh, our anticipated cost for the total project is $4 million. Uh, and the proposed or hoped outcome of this presentation is for you, Council, to affirm a design build methodology for the project. So, any questions at that point, this point? Commissioner Tafano. Yeah, hi, thank you, Rob. Have you had any quotations on previous designs for construction costs they listed in the last five years? For the town of Matthews? No, for the construction of this fire station. Has there any been any costing estimates at all? Uh, yes, that's that's where we derived the $4 million number. Do, do you have a specific, or was there more than one cost estimate? Or was this from one particular company? 
No, th no, we are not allowed to ask for cost estimates at this point, but based on industry average, average construction cost per square foot site work, uh, we anticipate about a 10,000 square foot building uh, construction and site costs are somewhere north of $300, $300 a square foot. Um, we have seen examples of other projects similar in size and scope that are in the three to four million dollar range. Uh, how long has this uh, fire station plan been on the books? It's been about three or four years, hasn't it? Well, we, we purchased the land at the beginning of 2021. Uh, the, the need for fire station three has been identified years before I got here. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we uh, through our ISO uh, grading in 2020, we saw a coverage deficiency in the Purser Holsey Park Phillips Road area that will only be addressed by the addition of Fire Station 3. Have you had any estimates about what the cost per square foot will be in the upcoming months or even toward the end of this year? How there will uh, be an increase in inflation? That, that's why we're guessing about $4 million. Uh, when we started this, looking at this project about three years ago, the cost was about $200 a square foot, uh, current costs. And, and it, it depends whether you want a Taj Mahal fire station or do you want a very conservative fire station. We feel that three to $400 a square foot will give us a, 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 an inflation um, covered estimate. Uh, it will give us some opportunity to make um, uh, make decisions on what we want in the station, what we don't need, with, need what we can live without. Um, but there's site work to be done, DOT, driveway connections to be made. Um, so our best estimate based on industry average is like I say, three to $400 a square foot. And you're right, the cost is going up dramatically. Yeah, that's exactly the information I was looking for. So two years ago, if I heard you right, it was estimated at around $200 a square foot. So in the, last, in the last two years, there's been a 50% increase in cost of construction. And we have full um, belief that that rate of inflation is going to continue at its current pace during this year as well. Okay, that, that's you. correct. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. All right. Um, do we have any other questions or motions? Mayor, just a quick comment. So if we use this design build process, we would get proposals, staff would vet them, and then we'd bring back a recommendation to the board, but the board would make the final decision on this design build contract not the staff. Yeah, I, uh, I think Chief Kennenberg explained uh, the difference, different uh, methods of doing this very clearly. So it's, it's clear to at least to me. So I, I would be uh, happy to move forward, but we need a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the use of design build for the fire station three project. Thank you, Commissioner I Garner. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. Second from Commissioner Urban. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Tofano? Yes. Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Commissioner Garner? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. I vote yes as well. And uh, I don't think uh, Matthews necessarily needs a Taj Mahal, but we want a really nice uh, uh, fire station that's fully adequate for what we need. And I, Rob, what do you expect the life expectancy of this uh, fire station to be? Probably at least 50 years, correct? Yes, sir. 50 to 100 years. So we um, want to build something that's nice. Yes, sir. And I just want to be clear to, to council, if we proceed with a design build process, our, by state law, we're obligated to engage a third party to help us with the bridging documents um, that lay out the scope of the project, 
um, so that respondents to the RFQ are proposing apples to apples type of projects. So we will we will revise our RFQ and we will seek to engage a third party. And if it's within the manager's scope, we can move forward with that uh, dollar allowance for the manager. If not, we'll have to come back to council for um, bridging document work. Did I, I say that you. right, John? Yeah, I, I raised my hand on that, Rob. Um, can if, Hopefully, if the board allows it, I'd like to work with Rob on what the scope of work for the bridging documents are, because bridging documents to me may mean a floor plan and an elevation and a nice wall section, but bridging documents to another firm might be, you know, a complete set of preliminary design drawings, which is far more elaborate. And, you know, we don't necessarily want to spend all the money up front. We want the design build team to do some work too. So I'd like to be at least in, in get involved in how we're going to discuss what the scope of the bridging documents are. Rob, can you get us back out off of the, so we can have our full screen? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Commissioner Tafano? Yes, uh, I would like to have, in addition to construction costs and all of that, at the very same time that those estimates are coming in, I'd like to have full um, setup costs and operational costs, uh, yearly operational costs. What I mean by setup costs is any new equipment that has to be purchased because of the fire station, new personnel, uh, maintenance costs, any any costs, any costs associated with uh, other than the construction costs and uh, ongoing operations. So we can look at the whole thing as a um, as a package. Chief Kinnenberg, I believe previously you said there would be, uh, correctly, I think like 18 employees, is that right? Or was there more than that? I forgot the number that would be there. Yes, uh, over the next, I mean, to pro fully uh, operate this fire station, uh, we need uh, 10 people per shift per station. So we would be looking to hire uh, 18 total uh, over some period of time to staff this station and provide the the 10th person on the for the two existing companies uh, plus equipment purchases correct yes sir yeah the other thing to, to remember is we will be uh, eliminating the our subsidy of auto wild as well so that'll help offset a little bit of that uh, commissioner garner um, I'd like for Commissioner uh, Tafano to clarify what equipment numbers he's asking for. What sort well, of equipment are you asking estimates for? You would probably, not probably, absolutely have to have additional uh, rescue vehicles, uh, fire engines, perhaps a ladder truck, um, and ongoing in order to, the staff has to obviously have equipment to operate. So in addition to the construction of the building, you've got considerable costs for the actual initial outlay of fire uh, and, and rescue equipment. Uh, plus there's all kinds of training involved that would have to be done with the new employees, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, everything and anything that has to do with getting this fire station up and operational. We, we, we can provide our best estimate at this point. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. We appreciate uh, your presentation and I think we've addressed this. So we'll move on. Thank you, council. Agenda item number 13, the mayor's report. I have a couple brief items. Uh, first, as I mentioned earlier, I was with uh, the APS charities this afternoon. And uh, because of that, uh, the folks that accompanied MB, we had at least four doctors with us. And so naturally the topic turned to COVID and um, I think the consensus of the doctors that I was with this afternoon uh, were that uh, number one, we are rapidly uh, approaching herd immunity that they've always talked about because about 62 and a half percent of all Americans, adult Americans have been fully or have been vaccinated to some extent. Uh, another 20 to 25% have had COVID and, uh, and, it's, and it's going so quickly uh, that 
pretty soon we're going to approach numbers of 90 or 95 percent of the folks have either had COVID or or have been vaccinated or both. So we will be approaching herd immunity. And the doctors also, as Chief Kennenberg mentioned, seem to think that uh, COVID cases were going to peak uh, within the next couple of weeks, and we should see a, a rapid decline thereafter because everybody will have either had COVID or or be uh, vaccinated. So I think that's encouraging. It was encouraging to me to, to to see after two years if we can finally see the end, the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, I want to remind you again of uh, Commissioner Whitley's. Uh, the MLK uh, activities. And I'd like to ask Commissioner Whitley, if you could send us, if you haven't already, I think you have sent an invitation, but maybe send it again so that everybody's aware of the uh, activities that are going on next Sunday and next Monday. And finally, uh, if you'll grant me a little uh, personal uh, announcement, I'd, li I'd like to uh, wish my father a happy birthday. He celebrated his 88th birthday this past Saturday. But what's even more amazing than that is he's been married to my mother for 66 years. So uh, love you, dad and mom. And I think that's pretty amazing. I hope I hope I have uh, that much left in the tank for myself. So um, that's all I have on the mayor's report. We'll go on to the attorney's report. No report, mayor. Thank you. Town manager's report. No report, mayor. All right. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Before we, before we adjourn, uh, one other thing. We are holding a testing site at Mount Moriah on the 18th of this month from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, McMurray County Health Department from 11 to 2. So drive through, free testing, uh, stay in your car. I just want to give that information to everybody. Thank you. And uh, I've been to your, been tested several times at your, uh, at your church and it's, generally not a huge crowd there certainly not the uh, I, I went to Cinemark a couple of weeks ago and that was talking to Commissioner Garner they, they said there was an eight-hour wait uh, to, to be tested so I, needless to say I didn't stay there but uh, so yeah I encourage you to take advantage of that you said the 18th from 11 to 2 that's correct all right thank you we had a motion from okay. Mayor Pro Tem McCool do we have a second to adjourn second second from Commissioner Whitley we'll take a roll call vote Mr. Capano? Yes. Commissioner Hoover? Yes. Commissioner Garner? Yes. Commissioner Whitley? Good night to y'all and yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCool? Yes. Mr. Urban? Yes. I vote yes as well. I want to thank Commissioner Urban for, uh, for participating tonight, although he's not feeling well. Thank you, sir. You had some uh, good input tonight and we appreciate you. Uh, Harris Starr, John. Meds will do wonders. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. We'll talk to everybody soon. See you tomorrow. Oh, Georgia. Go, Georgia. Okay.